Um, are there any apologies for absence? Apologies from Margaret Patterson. Margaret Patterson. And are there any declarations of interest? Angela? Um, item five, family members are council tenants and it's non-financial. And item six, a family member has a garage um, as well, non-financial for me. Okay. Okay, um, just before we start the formal proceedings, I'd just like it noted that how pleased we all are that Councillor Patterson's on the road to recovery after her operation last week. Um, I'm told she's becoming more confident, more mobile, and we look forward to seeing her back with us very soon. Delighted this afternoon to have uh, an item of good news to start with. And I'm very happy and pleased to welcome Ron McCauley of the Peffrey Way Association to tell us all about um, his uh, this particularly good project that, that he has been so much part of over the last few while. And after that, just before I welcome Ron in, if I could just note that with your approval, we'll move item nine up the, the agenda. To, to come in after Ron as Derek Martin has pressing business, which is COVID related, I believe. So over to you, Ron. Okay, well, first and foremost, thanks very much for inviting me along uh, to give you an update. I was trying to check when it was that I last spoke with yourselves, um, and I think it was back in August 2018. So I'm pleased to say that there has been quite a lot of good progress since then. Uh, although we still have a couple of barriers to completing the path, which I'll, I'll touch on as we go through. Um, Di, I, I gave some slides. I don't know if you shared them or... Yes, Alison's got them ready if you need her to update them. The, well, can you... I, I, I take it, Alison, you can show them on the screen, can you? Or just... I'll, I'll keep going while Alison perhaps does that. Um, OK, I'm, I'm sure you'll all uh, be well aware of the purpose of the Peffrey Way. It's, it's to try and create this all abilities path between Sir Pepper and Dingwall that takes folk away from the, the busy uh, A834 and it doesn't require them to cross over the operational railway that runs along there. Um, so we've, we've been making, as I say, very good progress. And I just want to run through the different sort of headings, if I can, as we've gone through things. You remember that back in January 2017, we got planning permission in place for the entire route. And uh, that was what I would describe as a major milestone. Now, while planning um, helped enormously, clearly there were still some other things that we had to address. And the first one was fundraising. Um, and fundraising has been, well, a, a major issue throughout the project. But I'm pleased to say that, oh, thank you, Alison. Uh, I'm pleased to say that so far we have um, raised over 340,000, and this has come from a number of different sources, um, including, I should say, the Highland Council's Ward Discretionary Fund. So I'd like to just thank you guys again for the support you've given uh, in that funding that funding route. Um, um, uh, you'll, you'll not be surprised if you hear me say that I hope to come knocking on your door again, but that's um, by the by. I'll mention that again later on. One of the biggest um, sources of our funding has been uh, a government grant called the Scottish Rural Development Programme, a thing called the Agri-Environment Climate Change Fund. Um, and through that fund, we've managed to raise quite a lot of money, which has allowed us to do some fairly large chunks of the path. But we've also uh, got money from all, a, a wide range of, of different funds, like the Crerar Hotels Trust, the, um, the Gordon and Ina Baxter Foundation, a local trust called the Mackenzie New York Villa Trust, which has helped us, um, your own war discretionary funds, but also um, the National Lottery, and perhaps most importantly, from local groups like Not Bain Farm have contributed quite significantly to the, the progress of the project, not just in the support they've given us, but also in financial terms. And um, one that I must mention is quite a large number of local donations, some of them quite significant, from just local people who have been keen to see the path progress. So it's been extremely good for us in, in terms of sort of boosting morale within the team and taking it forward. Um, 
one thing I should highlight is that some of these grants we've had uh, have been paid retrospectively. So we've had to fork out money to do the work and then claim it back. And we've again been supported by some local groups with interest-free loans, um, which have helped us to finance the work before we were able to uh, claim the grant and then pay the loans back. And that's made a huge difference. So a quick potted history about construction. Um, work started in earnest after we got the planning permission in 2017. And again, uh, that was with the help of Highland Council, the first section from Strathpeffer Station to the sewage works in Strathpeffer uh, was largely done by Highland Council. So again, uh, many thanks for that. The next phase that we did was from uh, that bit of work right down to a point about 600 metres further on heading towards Dingwall. Um, and that was done in 2018. The biggest sections of path were built in 2019 when we did uh, the sections that run parallel to the operational railway, and they were by far the more difficult bits to do. And we did um, two large chunks of that section in 2019 and then completed in 2020 a section that was particularly difficult because it uh, was undulating ground and, and needed quite a bit of work to it. And then this year, we've done another 360 metres or so at um, Blair Ninnach, and we've also finished off the what we call the Fordity Cemetery link path, which is the path around the cemetery. Um, you might remember you met with us to discuss going through the cemetery, and with one thing or another, that um, was abandoned, and we, we've now created the path around the outside of the cemetery. So in, in total, we have now, and if you could show the next slide, Alison, in, in total, uh, we have now completed four kilometres out of the six kilometre length. So if you see on that map, the light blue coloured sections, they are all completed. The, the green sections are the sections that we hope to uh, get on with next year. Uh, and these are, these are the last bits that we have full landowner permission in place for. And the two red sections, the one uh, sort of just to the left of middle, and then the one down near the word Dingwall are the two bits where we still have problems. So what are we doing about these bits where we have problems? Well, um, there are two approaches here, and both of them, uh, again, involve the services of Island Council. So once again, I'm thanking you for that too. And in particular, I should mention uh, Karen Lyons and Phil Wade, who have uh, helped enormously with this, this work. Um, if I take the first bit, which is the Mill Lane Croft section, which is the red bit to the left of middle of that map, um, what we're hoping to do there is go down the route of the core path plans uh, update. Uh, it's been included in, in, um, in, in the co initial consultation for the core path plans for the Wester Ross area and has been um, voted on by the Wester Ross Committee to um, have it included as part of, a core, of the core path plans going forward. However, there's a second consultation has to be carried out to cover those paths within Wester Ross where a change has been made since the first consultation. And once that consultation is done, the whole thing should then go to Edinburgh uh, for ministers to determine. And hopefully, if that uh, comes through, then it means that that section of the path would become a core path and um, any obstructions would be able to be removed by Highland Council using statutory powers that you have under the Land Reform Scotland Act of 2003. It wouldn't allow us to build the path, but it would allow us to clear any barriers. And that's the important thing. Um, now, turning to the east end of the path, down at the Dingwall end, where that, the word Dingwall is shown in the map there, that very, very short section, maybe about 150 metres, if you can now show the next uh, slide, please, Alison. Um, these are photographs of, of the section that I'm talking about. The access comes in off of Mill Street. So that first picture on the left is the uh, small cul-de-sac, which is a public road, uh, and people have access to it already. But at the far end picture, you'll see a blue van, and behind that blue van is a gate that goes into an old access track that gets you through to a field. The next two pictures are pictures of the access track as it currently stands. And if Alison, if you could switch to the next slide. The, yeah, so there's the same 
gate that was shown in the right-hand picture in the previous slide, and then the, the next two show the bit of field before you then join the path that's already been constructed. Now, what we're doing here is we're going for what's called a path order. Um, again, it's using Highland Council's um, statutory powers under the Land Reform Scotland Act, where um, effectively we have exhausted trying to get agreement with the landowners there. They refuse to speak to us, basically. So Highland Council have now written to the landowners on three occasions, asking them to uh, enter into negotiations or enter into agreement with them. On each occasion, they've been turned down or not received a response. So they have served a draft path order on them. And under the process, the landowners have, I think it's 28 days to respond to the draft path order. Um, and if there's no response or they accept it, then the path order is immediately put into place and we can build the path across the land. But in this case, the, the landowners did respond and we received three objections from four landowners. So the fourth one uh, objected, but then withdrew his objection. Uh, so what's happened now is that we have, with the help of Karen and Phil, submitted uh, a path order to Scottish Government, which is the next stage in that process. Um, the Scottish Government, through the Department of Planning and Environmental Appeals, has appointed a reporter who will now consider um, the objections and consider the proposal that we put forward along with all the supporting information that we've submitted. Uh, and hopefully the reporter will then uh, come to a, uh, a determination, which he will then put to ministers to confirm or otherwise. Um, the, interestingly, the, the landowners, the, the three landowners who have maintained their objection, um, were all asked to submit, or in fact, so was the council, asked to submit what is called a written hearing statement, which basically sets out all, you know, the reason you want this path or the reason you don't want it, and also sets out who would attend the hearings and would give evidence and whatever. Um, we, along with Karen and Phil, submitted a comprehensive hearing statement by the deadline, which was After some weeks, he gave them a, a second chance to submit, and um, he didn't receive anything from one of the objectors by way of response. But on the other two, um, he received a letter saying that the pair of them uh, wanted their objection. So that's sorry, sorry, Ron, if I could just interrupt on. there. Certainly on my machine, you cut out just at the crucial point there. Um, we got to the, the two objectors said, and then you went. <laughs> oh, so, sorry about that. The, the, two, the two objectors who happened to be a brother and sister um, wrote saying that while they wanted their objection to stand, they had no wish to participate in the process. So it means that if there is a, a, a public hearing on the matter, um, basically, there will be no hearing at the hearing, which seems rather odd, to put it mildly. Um, so we are now in the hands of a reporter, waiting for him to decide what the next steps are and what he wants to do. It's highly likely that he will do a site visit to basically walk the Pefri Way and see for himself what's there. Um, he then might call for additional evidence if he wants it or he feels it's needed. And then um, the process would normally allow for a public hearing. But given the responses from the objectors, it may be that he decides not to hold a hearing, but to simply seek additional um, information in writing and then uh, make a determination without a hearing. So we, we, we are basically now playing a waiting game to hear what the next stage will be. But that's where we've got to um, with the whole process. And, and as I've, as I've emphasised, um, Karen and Phil have been uh, excellent in terms of the support we've had here. Um, you have a very good lawyer in the form of Karen Lyon. She's, uh, she knows her stuff very well. So um, if we get the path order, the difference here is that we will be able to build the path, which um, is what we want to do. Um, and I should point out that if this path order is successful, 
and we see no change in approach from the landowner at the other section of land where we have a problem, there's a very good chance that we'll be coming back and asking the council to promote a path order in relation to that section so that we can move on and hopefully complete the path. Next steps, um, I mentioned already that over uh, next year, we're actually applying at the moment back to the Scottish Rural Development Programme uh, for more grant money. And if that comes off, then we're hopeful of completing what I showed as green sections in that map uh, that was on the, the previous slide. Um, that would give us another um, 1.2 kilometres on top of the four that we've already built. So it would mean that we were getting very close to completion and the only bits that would be left to build would be the two bits where the landowner issues exist. Um, we've already secured, I mentioned the need for interest-free loans, we've already secured two of those loans for next year. So we're in, in good position there. But um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we we may well be submitting another application to your ward fund if we can to, to try and um, get some more funding to, to help us with the whole process. Um, in the words of Tesco, every little helps and, and it's very much the case. Um, one final issue, um, which really the first slide that I showed uh, referred to, and that is the issue of, of maintaining the path. I think it's just worth highlighting that so far, if you can go back one more, please, Alison. Uh, so far, um, we've been able to maintain the path quite successfully through volunteer groups uh, and volunteer days. And as you can see from some of these pictures, the one on the right in particular, um, we've been very, very lucky in that a lot of members and uh, local community members have been willing to come out and help us with weeding work, with strimming, grass cutting, um, you know, general sort of tidying up work. Um, and it's made a huge difference. It, it's made it, you know, really um, get the path in good condition. But we also have what we call um, a last of the summer wine team. And this is uh, a group of about four or five of us who are all happily retired with a bit of spare time in our hands. And uh, we're all also quite capable of turning our hands to some fairly complex bits of DIY, such as fencing, erecting handrails, that sort of stuff. And that's helped us um, build some of the bits of the path at you know, very, very low cost, which has uh, helped us get through quite successfully. So hopefully that brings you up to speed. There's been a lot done, but there's still a lot to do. Um, it's been great fun so far, and I'm, I've no doubt that it will continue to be that way. And I've got to say that we are blessed with a, a great group of trustees who are all a very determined group of people, um, all of a similar mind. Uh, and we're absolutely certain that we will see this path completed and hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later. But um, but and, and as I've, I've mentioned throughout this, we benefit enormously from a great level of support from the members and from the community as a whole um, and from people like yourself. So thanks very much for that and please continue to do so. OK, Ron, thank you very much for that. I'll open it up. Angela, any, anything you want to comment on? I hadn't even put my hand up yet, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I, I do really appreciate uh, Ron being here today. And I remember the first meeting where you came and said what the proposals would be. And it's hard to believe that it's been nearly five years. Um, and the amount of work that you and 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 your your team, as you say, and others have put in over the years. But I think that the that it kind of came to the fore during COVID, the number of people that used the route during COVID of all ages um, was amazing. And, and I know that you've got a Facebook page and the numbers are increasing all the time. Um, and um, I wondered um, with a, if once this path order has been approved or um, the reporter has overcome the objections, Will you still be keeping the Knock Bain Road um, route open? Because sometimes, you know, because that can be quite steep. And I know that um, when there's some parts of the path are all access ability. And by looking at those pictures there from Mill Street along, it looks as if that would be part of the flat part of the path. And because it, it was well used. Um, so I just wondered about that. Thank you. Yep. The, the 
the intention is to try and link the Pefi Way with as many paths as possible. So the the, the one up to Knock Bain uh, will stay open. Um, the the one there's another one further along that goes up a, a very steep hill to Knock Bain Farm as well. And then further along at Fodderty, there's links up to Knock Farrell and, and things like that. And we're keen to to give people as many options as possible to link in with other paths. But the the the, the Pefe way itself, we try to keep the gradients as gradual as possible so that mobility scooters and, you know, families with prams and buggies and things can, um, you know, basically access it with ease. Um, and of course, once once the path's fully open, um, the Dingwall Academy will be able to have cycle to school days from Strip Pepper, which they can't do at the moment, basically. Um, so we've been keeping in touch with, you know, the headmistress there and and with, in fact, with all the schools um, in the area we've been keeping in touch with. And, you know, it just it opens up so many more opportunities. I'm trying to remember what else, what the second point of your question was. I've forgotten it, sorry. No, would, no, it was just about the, if at Mill Street, would it, that, because that's kind of flat, would that make it more all access at that side oh, as well? Yes. And you yeah, kind of covered would, that. I should yeah. say that I have done most of the path myself. I'm going off the cat's back. What a view we had. <laughs> yes. Good, good. I hope, I hope you, you I should emphasise that the entire route, including the sections where the landowners are not in favour, the entire route benefits from what's called access rights. So people do have a legal right to cross that land, providing they do so responsibly. And by responsibly, I mean, you know, keep dogs in check and not, you know, leave gates open that shouldn't be left open, that type of thing. Um, so no one is breaking the law by crossing these bits of land. And and what we're doing is, is basically opening up so that you don't have to open gates. Um, and I should also say that what we're trying to do is by trying to negotiate where we are with the landowners, we're offering things like fences and gates that would keep um, people and dogs along the path and stop them wandering through fields and or scaring livestock and things like that. But unfortunately, um, it's just, you know, it's not seen that way, unfortunately. Yeah, that is unfortunate, especially if you're virtually offering to improve their facilities. It's yeah. odd to think that they wouldn't take it up. Uh, yeah. And uh, is Alistair with us now? He was, and then he kind of disappeared, and they might come back. Can I ask then? Are you going to use the 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 trial bike and kind a of taxi thing again? You know, where you're pedalling some of the older residents in the community. Yeah. Are you going to try that again, Ron? Well, yes, most definitely. The um, the thing that's stopping us is is that um, one of these bikes probably costs about nine or ten thousand. Um, so we need to do a bit of fundraising for that. But what we've been focusing on is is basically getting as much of the path open as possible so that when we do start to use the bike, we've got a really good long um, route to take folk along, if you like. Um, for, those, for those of you who are maybe not familiar with this, this is one of these what's called tri-shots. They're effectively uh, a trike, an electric trike that has an armchair at the front. And the armchair will, is big enough to take two people um, and then the, the pilot, as it's called, um, is the person who rides the bike and sits behind these two people. And what, what the idea is, is that you're able to go to a care home or, or not, not just a care home, but to, you know, people's houses where perhaps, um, you know, folk aren't able to get out and they're lonely and whatever. You put them in the, the armchair in the front and then take them for a ride along the Pepe Way. And the beauty of it is that they're out in the fresh air and, and they're getting a bit of company and it's fantastic for improving mental health and all these sort of things. So that that is the plan. But uh, let us get the path finished first, if you don't mind. <laughs> well, that's excellent. Thanks, Ron. Um, this has been an exceptional community effort. A uh, tremendous community project, and we've been happy to support it all the way through. And I think you'll find us receptive when you come calling again. At least I would hope so. Um, can in return uh, for your thanks, can I ask you to pass on our thanks to your committee members, volunteers, all your helpers for the magnificent job that they're doing, and hopefully the landowners may have a change of heart in due course and we're able to speed yeah. on our way to completion. Yeah. So. Thanks.
grateful for you for giving your time up this afternoon and thanks very much for coming along. No, no thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, yeah. Ron. Bye. Thank you. OK, members, we were asked to note that report. Um, I'm, apologies, Derek, I got, got things a little wrong earlier on. We'll, we'll stick with the order as far as the police are concerned, and then we'll come to you. So over to you, Kevin, for the next report. Chair, thanks very much. And members, um, thanks for having me along. Um, just a little bit of an update around, around staffing in the area. So Jamie Wilson, Chief Inspector, has moved on to uh, headquarters to a new role and is due to be replaced by uh, Scott McDonald. Uh, Scott's currently off sick. We're not sure when he's due back. So um, I'm sort of been parachuted in as a bit of an interim cover for there. Uh, Richard Ross will remain in post just now as uh, the inspector for your own area. So if there's other changes, we'll make sure you're updated on that as we move forward. Um, in relation to the report, uh, I know it was sent out to yourselves, so I, I hadn't planned to, to go through it um, page by page, but um, probably more uh, open it up to yourself for any questions, uh, and then just a, a couple of bits to cover after that, if you're okay with that, Chair. I'm fine with that. Thanks for that. Angela, I'll pass to you first if you have any questions. Um, Angela's never, she's never got questions. I know, I know. <laughs> I had all morning to get ready for this, Kevin. <laughs> No, I do have actually, and, and I, I know that um, people think COVID is over, but it's not over. And your offices are out meeting vulnerable people, you know, helping um, all year round. And um, I think we should appreciate, I know that there's some are, are at COP, but, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of good work in the community. And there are parts in the report where you've mentioned that working uh, with the community planning partners too. Um, so I'll start, you say, you say that speeding's down. Uh, 20, let's see, 27, but there's, and there's increased, there's been a number of increased patrols, um, and my, I wondered, um, later on, you talk about the North Coast Fast 500 and the visitor management um, plan, and um, how is this promoted through the media channels, and how much is it costing um, to do that, and does that come out of the police budget, or Highland Council or the Community Planning Partners budget? Is that just on the radio? Um, Mo, do you want me just to keep going, Kevin? Or And then I'll, you can see I'll you've forgotten my questions. <laughs> if there's awkward <laughs> ones, I'll just skirt over them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and um, motor vehicle thefts um, have, up, have gone up to from three to four, which it doesn't seem a lot. But um, is that vehicles been left opened or is that just opportunism? Or Because um, sometimes you see on Facebook, it comes up that there's um, people going through a village. Um, and I wondered, um, how do you pick up the intelligence on that? Um, an increase in vandalism, and that is a big concern um, in all our communities, uh, because that's gone up from five to 14. Um, and I wonder, do you have any statistics on ages, age groups, or um, anything like like that? Or is it in because it's from April to September, so it's not even over the winter months, you know? Because sometimes it increases. Um, Antisocial behaviour orders. I'm I'm surprised that there's none in place. Um, to be honest, given uh, some of the um, housing areas that you've, your officers have had to. Um, focus on uh, over the that time period. Um, missing people reports. You've got a liaison officer. Um, that has that made a big difference. It says in your report that they are dealing with a number of the um, children's homes. And that's all my questions to you. I think. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hopefully, I'll pick up uh, most of them. So. Uh, the promotion of the visitor management scheme and that, um, I'm not 100% sure around uh, the payment and that. Certainly, if it's if it's stuff that's been led by the police, then there, there'll be no real cost in that because we, we would pretty much do that through our own social media channels, I would think. Um, over and above that, then I'm afraid uh, I don't really have much of an answer around that one. The stolen vehicles, um, I don't have the fine detail, but I know that uh, prior to me coming back, we, we were hit by one individual who had moved around the area and um, a bit of opportunity and uh, had taken a couple of different vehicles. So 
I, I don't see it as a as a rising trend and, and something for us to be overly concerned about. Yeah, we, we did have something out in the media just recently around um, reminding car owners, etc., around their, their own security. So, yeah. Uh, and again, linked to the, the intelligence with that, then certainly we had one out with this area um, further north, where again, it was through the communities that we actually identified the individual involved in that. So, so that that's why we would try and still keep pushing out through our social media channels to to try and get that information in. Uh, vandalisms, yeah, they they are a bit of a blight of the not just this area, and uh, I would say that primarily it it will involve youths, um, and probably right across the north, our detection rate in relation to vandalisms is not great, um, and and mainly because. There's never any witnesses that we can that we can get. So, um, the the person walking down the street knocking wing mirrors off the car. Quite often, we will we will trace those those sort of individuals. But the the broken window in the street or or stuff like that. Sometimes we're not getting anywhere with them. So yeah, total acceptance from ourselves around uh, around that. And if anybody's got any ideas how we can stop that, then uh, I'm more than willing to take that on board. Uh, antisocial behaviours, um, antisocial behaviour orders. Uh, there's the the process to go through to actually to get them in place is um, sometimes takes a year or or more. So um, quite often the the actual the issue has has disappeared before we can get through that actual process. So. You won't have to think too hard about an individual that was living pretty close to the police station here, who again we looked at the the ASBO process for them probably just about a year or so ago, uh, and in conversations with with John Lee through through the housing side, you know, he knew that given the background, he knew that given the circumstances that to go to the sheriff it, it would have been rejected anyway. Um, and and the, the amount of work that would take, and I'm, and I'm not saying that's a reason for not doing it, but the amount of work actually knowing what the outcome is going to be um, made that one really pointless. So I would have suggested going forward with that. So there is certainly a fair bit of conversation between ourselves and John and, and some of the other ones in housing um, through that anti-social behaviour partnership group meetings where, where where we do look at these things and, and, and it is trying to get it into some sort of normality and and decide whether it, I don't mean worth going for it, but what the impact of that is going to be given the time scale around it. A uh, missing persons, yeah, undoubtedly the the liaison with the with the care homes does and has made a difference, and um, having that point of contact so that so that they can raise concerns with us, um, there and then makes a difference for us, but. The majority, I would say, or the high majority of of that numbers of of people missing will be from either looked after children or children that are somewhere within the the sort of the care scheme, um, wh which is a challenge and it is something that we're looking at across North Highland just now. Um, I know some of the the care homes are are struggling with with staff like like everybody else, so. Yeah, that, that side of it is a is a real challenge, um, and and the conversations that we are looking to have with the care homes is around is around their risk assessments and and their briefing to staff. But, but ultimately, it's it's not us that lead on that, but it's it's us that, that that generally the impact is on. So, it's how we can work and support some of the the, the care homes with that. So, so we'll we'll continue with that that plan with that liaison officer just to um. Try and keep that that strong links with the care homes. I'm hoping I picked up most of your questions there. Yes, and if I could come back in, Chair, just because Mark's here and he's on housing, because I find that um, what you said about antisocial behaviour that that there is no incentive for the, those uh, tenants who are being antisocial to stop being antisocial because um, you know they sometimes they can. Um, cause a great deal of, um, I wouldn't like to say terrorise, but but they cause a lot of problems to some of their neighbours. And it, it seems to be that it doesn't matter how often they complain about what's happening. Um, either the problem gets moved 
or the tenant that's complaining can get moved, but the the, the individual causing the antisocial behaviour or the family causing the antisocial behaviour in some instances in our ward, um, they seem to not um, take on that responsibility of behaving as a good tenant. And as you say, in some cases, there, it's very difficult to move that forward. And so there, sh there needs to be a, an alternative, I think. Um, and, and how that's done, perhaps it is liaising more closely with those tenants that are causing most of the antisocial behaviour um, and so that everyone in that community feels safe. So. It's, um, and I, I don't know, Mark may comment on it when it comes to his section, but um, it, it is a challenge uh, and the, 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 dif the difficulty again is because the tenant at number two is, is creating an issue it's it's not that sort of thing that we can deal with overnight. Yeah, if it's a one-off, that's fine. But certainly through the the twice weekly meetings that we have with uh, with with Donna and the other housing providers, then then the process that, that we try to have in place. And yeah, the last eighteen months has made that difficult. But it's around that sort of early and effective intervention. So if there's an issue tonight, if it means that we can get round there with with a housing officer or or a joint visit with the police tomorrow, then then I think that seems to be the most effective views. Sorry, Mark, I don't know if you've got other thoughts on that. Yeah, please feel free to come in, Mark. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, I don't know if we've met before, but I have overall responsibility in the council for the council's uh, housing uh, stock and the chief officer for housing and property services. Um, and I'm, I know Rory's also on uh, the call today, so I can give a sort of overview. And if Rory has any particular practitioner points, it might be useful to uh, invite him in as well, Glenn, just for a couple of comments after me. Um, I suppose there are some uh, shared challenges that the police and ourselves um, have. So, whilst um, from our perspective, the tenancy agreement is a matter of contract law, so uh, any um, sanctions applying as a result of a breach of it are civil matters rather than criminal matters in the main. Um, so, that's uh, the first uh, challenge. But in terms of uh, evidence, therefore, that we're required to get a balance of probabilities, not beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, so it's a slightly lower test. But in practice, what tends to happen is, um, you know, the, the, the courts have a wide amount of discretion in relation to tenancy agreements. So there is very little in terms of either the Housing Scotland Act or indeed in terms of the contract law elements of a tenancy agreement that have a mandatory uh, um, element to them where that um, agreement may be breached. So the classic example of that, Angela, uh, it's often, you know, somebody doesn't pay their rent. That's an absolute basic breach of a tenancy uh, agreement and the contract law. And it's very easy to prove because you've either paid it or you haven't paid it. And it's as simple as that. Uh, but the element as to whether or not you end up being uh, ejected from your home for non-payment is entirely a matter for the discretion of the courts in almost more every case. And uh, the courts are, generally speaking, uh, reluctant to interfere with someone's rights to remain living in a house, whatever we think about that. Now, same sort of kind of challenge applies when you're talking about um, any other breach of tenancy agreement, including um, antisocial behaviour. And so the test that will tend to apply is uh, as much about saying, have you proven the issue has taken place and it is, you know, uh, uh, causing nuisance annoyance or is a significant uh, occurrence that's happening all the time or it's a, a one-off but very big event. Nonetheless, what they'll be looking at is certainly in terms of a tenancy agreement comes down to either effectively um, an order for possession, either outright, you've got to leave your house right now or suspended for a period of time. In other words, behave yourself for a while. Otherwise, that order comes into force and you can get ejected um, or some form of interdict. Do or do not do something. And if you don't do what you're told to do, uh, then you can be subject to sanctions, including in some cases uh, fine and in theory at least uh, imprisonment, although I have to say in 30 years working in housing in Scotland and England, I've never yet known a, a tenant be imprisoned uh, as such. Um, I, it has happened, but just simply not in my experience. It's very, very rare. So I mean, I suppose the challenge is, it's not so much, and I think this is probably true from Kevin's perspective as well, it's not so much saying, can we show that someone has done something that they shouldn't do and it's a breach of criminal or civil law? It really does come down to, in many cases, Whichever court Kevin or I take someone to, it's a matter of judicial discretion. Uh, and sometimes I would suspect we would both share the same uh, frustration. I think I'll leave it at that um, in terms of the outcomes. I don't know if Rory's got some different practitioner's point of view. That's very much a sort of top line strategic, slightly legalistic view of it. 
um, uh, for me uh, overarchingly. And um, Rory's probably a better place than I am, seeing as many years since I actually had to get out and knock on the door and tell people off for doing things they shouldn't be doing. Uh, he might have uh, a better take on the practical challenges on a day to day basis. Uh, thanks, Graham. You're muted, Councillor McKenzie. I beg your pardon, phone call came in. Um, is there anything you want to add, Rory? Yeah, just from the point of view of our our practice, um, yeah, we do work quite closely with with uh, Police Scotland on antisocial behaviour, and um, Chief Inspector McLeod alluded to the partnership. But um, you know, what I could do uh, in terms of antisocial behaviour in council housing estates, I could. Um, commit to catching up with Chief Inspector McLeod and reviewing cases and um, and, wor and um, working through these cases and see what status they're at um, and perhaps what actions we may, um, may be able to do. Um, we are somewhat constrained in terms of actions we can take where uh, matters stray into criminality because we don't want to uh, interfere with criminal processes. Um, but also where where we're managing antisocial behaviour, quite often these things, um, the, there's a um, mutual element of dispute amongst them. So you, there are quite a lot of work goes into building an evidentiary case. Um, we don't have housing officers on the estate all the time witnessing incidents as they happen. So we, we do rely on witness accounts. Um, and uh, Chief Inspector McLeod mentioned um, our antisocial behaviour investigator, um, John Lee, who he, he'll take statements and um, you know, we, we will take action against tenants um, where we can establish that there is a breach of their tenancy agreement, um, but we'll also work with police on ASBO proceedings, but um, yeah, they, as, as already mentioned that can that will take time as will any proceedings that yeah you know, we've got to prepare for um for court and um as mr rogers um alluded we are yeah we we are dependent on the discretion of the court and when it gets to that point okay ronnie thank you very much for that uh, nice to see you alistair are you finally back with us <laughs> Um, is there anything in the police report that you would like to chip in on? No, thanks, uh, Chair. Apologies, I've been having connectivity yeah, issues. <laughs> uh, just they... dropping it. No, I'm I'm happy with the with, uh, with the report. And Kevin, congratulations on your promotion, and uh, uh, good to see you back. And no, no, it's a good report, and I've no no issues at all with it. Thanks. Yep, and Angela mopped up most of what I was going to say, Kevin. But in, in, term, in terms of um, the increase in number of offences reported for the possession, supply of being concerned with supply of controlled substances has has dropped from 15 to 8. Now, is that a good news story, or are we, or, or a bad news story? I suppose. Because certainly public perception would have it that there is more controlled substances about than there was in the past. So I'm just just looking for a, a steer on that one. Uh, I would I would say it's probably not reflective of um, of what's going on in the communities. Um, we certainly during lockdown went through a stage where uh, the risk assessment around the execution of warrants um, was fairly stringent and um, purely to prevent officers going into some of the houses that we didn't really want to be in. Um, so that, that's probably got a slight effect on it. Uh, but no, I would probably agree with you, Chair, that that's not really um, reflective. There is just there's a new team about to be set up and they'll be based in Inverness, but, but they will dip in and out of um, of Dingwall and Easter Ross area, and their primary focus will be around the county lines. So, the the kids that are being shipped up and down the road to to deal drugs, so which we know is going on in this area, and is certainly going on in Alness and Regordon area as well. So, uh, that will be that team's focus will be around proactive work around them. So, and um, we'll certainly be pushing to try and get them across this side of the bridge too. 
Good, that's good news. Well, thanks for that, Kevin, and for the report and uh, for giving us your time today. Members, we're invited to note the progress made against the objectives set out within the Highland Local Policing Plan uh, attached to the Annex A to this report. Can we do that? Agreed. Thank you. Thanks again, Kevin, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for your time. Okay, moving on then, we'll come now to Derek Martin, um, agenda item number nine. I believe you're busy with COVID matters, Derek. Um, do you want to take take it over from there? Thanks so much, uh, Chair and members, uh, for this afternoon. Yes, just uh, to give you a brief COVID update, taking the opportunity. Uh, you'll be aware, no doubt, that uh, numbers are locally uh, going up, although I'm monitoring the Deputy First Minister uh, this afternoon, where numbers in the round are climbing slowly, but there is uh, an expected increase uh, coming our way. Certainly that would be reflected locally. Dingwall Primary uh, has uh, uh, some isolation going on in Primary 6 just now and some staffing issues, but they are remaining open, thank goodness. And Dingwall Academy, uh, it's like watching uh, a bingo callers with uh, the emails coming in of uh, the numbers going up um, each day uh, there, but Karen and her team continue to operate the school and we are currently investigating an outbreak uh, within, um, you know, eight or nine kids, uh, probably due to a party at the, at the weekend. So working closely with health protection, uh, of course, for the area, which is much wider than your own uh, area committee, um, it's uh, significant elsewhere. Och, in particular, is causing uh, some concern, and uh, people are tired, uh, but the head teachers are doing great. You would be, so, you are so proud of them. I know that. On to uh, the report that uh, you've received uh, for both the Ross and Cromarty Educational Trust and the Dunk Craig Trust. And uh, last year, for, for obvious reasons, there was no update. Uh, and we were on the back foot with giving out grants earlier last year because shutdown uh, came around the time of processing uh, grants. And there was a discussion with uh, uh, two of our senior members um, who. Um, uh, are within Ross and Cromarty, roughly speaking, uh, to say that uh, the income had absolutely bottomed out last year. Um, and uh, with the agreement uh, of uh, the two senior members, I found some money from the area uh, budget uh, to put into the trust fund on your behalf, members, uh, in order that we could make some payments uh, to, to folks. I mean, I was particularly worried about those students at university who you've granted uh, through delegated powers to me to ensure that they have a bursary uh, for um, uh, the, the duration of their courses. And uh, we were very worried that in fact, um, they, they would be significantly disadvantaged. The letters that come in around that from uh, parents and pupils and students uh, talking about um, family businesses going down the tubes and so on was quite quite distressing. And uh, so I think collectively we found a solution um, to that problem last year. Clearly that was out with the terms of the trust, but was an emergency measure and we couldn't do that again, obviously from, from area funds. In the round, you'll note that there was a significant income in 2019-20 of £227,000 and uh, members, I did my best to try and get some of that into the revenue uh, balance to support uh, grants and so on. But under the terms of the trust, I was not allowed to. Um, and that had to go into the capital, which is sitting around about £1.6 uh, billion. Pounds. Um, <clears throat> the average income most years is about £15,000 to that trust uh, there or uh, thereabouts. And you can see that there's a list of beneficiaries uh, to, to that trust. I think the key message is that the bursary, the multi-year ones, once you've awarded them once, subject to income, you need to keep awarding them for the duration of, the, of their course. Um, the Dun Craig Trust, um, again, uh, 
it's it's capital is pretty good at eight hundred thousand or there uh, or thereabouts, and uh, we try and uh, try and get most of that money out that's available in revenue uh, each year, and that's more for specialist arts, uh, sport, uh, national representation, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, we have given a, a list of the names of people uh, who have benefited uh, from that. Uh, going forward, my main concern is this. We don't have a full understanding of the worldwide economic impact of COVID yet. We know it's not looking good. And there is a chance because it's all invested that if those companies suffer badly, income to the trust, both those trusts could go down significantly. And there was a hit last year. But equally, if interest rates go up, which is also very likely going forward, there could be an increase in available funds. We simply don't know, but I am concerned that we might get to the stage where there's very little revenue available uh, for uh, grants to be made, even though the capital is large. And I have uh, looked at this legally to see, can we under these circumstances take something from the capital to ensure that grants could be paid? And the short answer is no, not under the terms of the trust and, uh, and, the, and the law around it. Um, so we have explored it, but I'm pleased to say we did manage to make uh, grants uh, last year. And uh, thank you to the advice and support um, of the senior members around trying to find a creative solution as a one-off. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, your microphone is off. Sorry about that. Any questions, members? Um, I just asked Eric, I'm sure Alistair, given his background, will have a few questions for you. Um, how often is, you, you in the report it talks about the shares, how often is the, where the shares are invested, reviewed? Is that done by Highland Council or on a regular basis? Um, I will try to find out. I'm not entirely certain about that detail behind it, but um, I think I think the easiest way is describing uh, those of us who had AA membership all those years ago, um, or perhaps had membership of a building society. And if that body chooses to go public or, or to sell on or whatever, then there's a dividend back to its members. And I suspect it's, it's round about that, that um, there was a decision by those kind of investment companies to sell on some shares and there was therefore, the, in effect, the kickback to the trust. Um, I think that's really what it was. Um, however, uh, I will endeavour to find out more from the finance uh, uh, side of things. Um, I just wondered because if it's a trust held by Highland Council, we as councillors then are overall responsibility, I would think, and therefore that's right, yes. that it is reviewed on a regular basis, the portfolio is reviewed, and I, I'm, I'm assuming that that's done by finance, but I yes. don't want you in case it's not, given your statement. Um, yes, it, it is reviewed uh, uh, by finance, but sometimes there's, there's bits outside of the council that have the effect, such as investment companies and so on, and we're the beneficiaries uh, of it. And you might recall that it was about oh, two years ago, I think, that we modernised the trust because it was significantly out of date, where, for example, grants uh, refer to, you know, five shillings and a small, a small dog. And we thought, you know, that's how, how do you work with that? And so uh, members approved at the old Ross and Cromarty Committee uh, the approvals to update it in line with uh, uh, modern uh, monetary uh, awards and so on. Thank you, Derek. You, you described um, your attempts to try and change some of the capital into revenue with, without success. Yeah. Is that something that has to remain in perpetuity, or is there any possibility of looking at the setup of the trusts to see if, if things can be changed in that regard? I think that's a, a good question, one that I asked. Um, the, the Ross and Cromarty Trust is actually governed by an Act of Parliament. Um, it's governed by the Ross and Cromarty Educational Trust Act. I think it's 1961 was the last time it was it was done, and of course 
uh, it's now fully devolved to to trustees and, uh, and the charities uh, body and things like that. Um, unfortunately, you no, know, under the terms of the trust, and it's actually multiple trusts that have been brought together in 1961, which is why we name, um, you know, like George Denoon Trust. It's actually a, a subsector of the Ross and Cromer Trust. Um, but no, it's actually within law, and um, we have um, very strict um, uh, matters around what we can do with the capital. And in short, we can't touch it. Oh, well. <coughs> I think right, that's well, <laughs> Sorry, Alistair. Sorry, could I come in, Graham? Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, it is annoying. It is really uh, annoying, Derek. And I take your point that when uh, the, the law states the capital has to remain, but I think the investment side uh, it depends on what the trustees' appetite is for for risk. Uh, like everything else, when 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 you're dealing with stocks and shares, you can have peaks and troughs, and and and, and that's the reality of it. And and I suppose. As long as it, it has been monitored on a on a on a regular basis, I mean, just because the stock market dips, uh, you know, you 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 sell high and and, and you buy low, uh, and and it's it's down to the trustees to to take that decision, and sometimes you've got to ride the storm, but it ultimately depends on their attitude to risks. The stock market at the moment is actually, believe it or not, actually doing very well, yeah. but it depends on whether you know, if as long as you don't have all your eggs in the one basket. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, thanks, Councillor McKinnon. You're, you're, you're right, and we do, of course, rely on uh, on the kind of monitoring, shall we say, uh, by the finance uh, side of things. Uh, I mean, it was last reviewed only, you know, as I say, about two years ago when I brought the, the paper to the old committee to say, you know, here's the recommendations and so on, and there was no real uh, changes uh, um, suggested at that point. Um, and I, I guess uh, going forward, um, you know, we'll, we'll look at, you know, where things are at. One of the other things that the trustees might wish to consider is, um, you know, what, what, what we're investing in, for example, or what you're investing in. Uh, so, for example, is there issues around uh, sustain, sustainable companies or um, uh, fossil fuels or, you know, arms? You know, there's these kind of things that you might wish to look at at some point. Um, so, yes, in short, we, we do gently monitor it in the background. Um, and uh, hopefully this year coming, we'll be in a position to make some more grants. OK, hopefully that's the case. Thanks for coming along today, Derek, uh, and for your report. And members, we are asked to uh, to note the report. Okay. No, and thanks for your hard work there, Derek. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. Uh, if you'll excuse me, uh, Chair, I will run away to deal with COVID. So excused. <laughs> Hi, now, bye. Okay, moving on then to agenda item five, the housing performance report, and I think it's over to you, Rory. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Um, I'm presenting the housing performance report today. I'm not going to go through it exhaustively, I'll, um, but I will point out a couple of couple of points. Um, uh, emergency repairs is still um, still tracking well. Non-emergency repairs um, it remains out with our performance targets. Um, as previously advised, this has been affected by the, the COVID lockdown and we're um, we're expecting ongoing impacts as we get through our repairs backlogs, um, and that's likely going to go through to in, into 2022. Um, the normally that we report on the void relet time, um, but on this occasion we have not been able to completely verify all of the figures for um, the. Um, Dingwall and Seaforth area, so we've not included that this time, but in, we will, um, as soon as we've got that updated, we'll let members know where we're at with the with the void relay performance. Um, rent arrears, you'll see, has increased again, um, but it's still within the, uh, it, it's still within a um, that downward trend that we've had since 
um, since the last few quarters of um, the, the previous year. Um, and you'll see homeless presentations has increased in quarter two across Ross and Cromarty. That's for the whole of Ross and Cromarty. Um, we're not able to disaggregate down to Dingwall and Seaport, but members will be aware, be aware that a fair proportion of our homeless caseload is within Dingwall and Seaforth. So I'll, I'll um, leave it to members to ask any questions that you've got at this point. Yeah, I'll open that up to the other members shortly. But in terms of the non-emergency uh, repairs, um, it would seem that we're behind the Highland average, um, quite quite away actually. Uh, is there a reason why Ross and Cromarty should suffer more intensely than other parts of Highland? The um, the the actual figure can fluctuate quite a bit depending depending on. Um, when a job is actually marked as complete. Um, and so it's not necessarily the case that um, over the over the long term that Ross and Cromedy is is behind in all cases. It, there often there might be a job, one or two jobs that take an extended period of time because of materials shortages. Um, depending, it depends very much on the particular type of job. Um, but uh, it it is um, you know it is behind the average, um, but it it often it depends you know when you've got you know, it depends on the um, the type of housing the type of repairs that are getting done uh, sure. in, in the different areas. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, Councillor McKenzie. But I'm, I'm not sure if it does um, uh, because. I, um, for over a year now, we, we, we have been consistently below the Highland uh, average. And I, I, I'm not blaming it. What I'm trying to, to say to you, Rory, is are we sure we've got enough resources in relation to the rest of the Highland to do as well as the rest of the Highlands? Um, well, I'd, I'd, I'd answer that by saying I've never met a maintenance officer yet that would say <laughs> that they couldn't do with more resources. Um, and that in, in terms of... Um, working through the current backlog it's a bit it's probably a bit difficult to say um of you know in, in, of how how we would direct the resources because a lot of the a lot of the delays are down to material delays and supply delays as well as accessing accessing trades so it's not just one answer it's not just one issue that's affecting um the performance figure um but i can take that Back to um, back to my colleague Colin, the, Colin Sharp, the repairs manager, and ask for more detail on that from him, if you like. I think it would be useful. I'd like to see some indication that we could be moving up the league table with regard to the other Highland communities in due course. As I say, it's five quarters now where we've been below below the average. Alistair. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I would agree with your, your comments there, Chair. You know, I would think that every part of the Highlands would be suffering from, from uh, supply, uh, not just England and CFO. So, yeah, it'd be good to get a bit more information on that, really, as to see why why we're, we're consistently behind. That's uh, so five quarters now. So, yep, yeah, I would look forward to maybe an updated report. Thank you. If there are no other questions, members. Yeah. We, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Angela, I didn't sorry. see your hand. Sorry, yeah. no, sorry, Chair. Go for it. Okay, thanks. See this going back and forth between the different parts of the <laughs> future, I'm getting mixed up. Um, yeah, no, thank you. And um, can I start? Um, and I'm glad Mark's here today. In that, I, I'm, and it's not just on housing and property, but it's in a number of the services. When it comes to the recommendation and implica implications, when it gets to the implications, it always says there's no equality, poverty, or rural um, issues um, linked to the report, or um, climate change issues linked to the report. And I'm just wondering, um, given that. Um, you know, we have declared a climate change and environmental ecological um, emergency. There will be climate change issues um, and also through the uh, poverty and um, equality. There will be when you go down to not paying a rent, 
you know, when you look at the outstanding rent for this period for quarter two, the arrears are at £120,249. And so there will be implications because if that's the the arrears for the rent, there will be they'll probably not be heating the properties, you know, because the, the, the they don't have uh, the tenants won't have much funding. So that will have an impact on our properties. And um the and, and, and housing and property is not the only service that does this. I think it's um we need to be looking at things as we move forward in a in a, a different um, we, when it, especially when it comes to the climate change um, a question on the implications. But I suppose you answered my question about the repairs, but um, about the lack of materials. And I know that's the same um, for some of our um, public toilets. They've had a great difficulty getting uh, replacement equipment for, for toilets. Um, but I wondered how many... Um, repairs are fixed on the first visit um you know because i i know of instances where the people have come out and said oh yes i know what's wrong oh i don't have that in my van i'll have to go to the store and get it and you think well why haven't you got most of what you need the basics in the van in the first place and that also would have mean that they would only be making one visit instead of two visits to to tenants and um, at 5.8, you talk about unable to gain access, and I know that it's not monitored, but um, what action are as the council taken to try and encourage tenants, because it's usually they have reported the fault in the first place, um, to make sure that they are in um, the property. And through the rent loss through voids, is this, that has increased, is that mainly because of COVID and the property's been empty longer than uh, previously? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor McLean. Um, with, with respect to the um, equality, poverty and climate change issues, I'll take that back to the management team. Um, I think that's certainly worth us reflecting on um, and ensuring that we get, we get that right in our report, in our reporting. And um, yeah, and that that carries through to our um, ongoing reporting. Um, the issues around not heating um, when someone is in rent arrears. Um, we do engage with the housing support. We've we've got um, quite a bit. We do quite a bit of work with housing with housing support to make sure that people are able to um, yeah access. Um, affordable heat if they can and we, through referring to affordable heat programs and um, also assisting with um, uh, food packages and things like that and um, any so there are things that we can that that are linked to those poverty issues um, in our in our management of rent arrears and um, we'll certainly reflect on that as well um, I'll take on notice your question about repaired at the first visit. Um, I do note that in the appendix one, the um, figure for quarter two for Ross, at Ross and Cromarty as a whole is 83 and a half, just over 83 and a half percent of reactive repairs were carried out first time across Ross and Cromarty. Um, I can seek out that figure for um, Dingwall and Seaforth and come back to the committee with that. Um, and um, sorry, your last question was about, um, I, I just missed the detail on your last question. So that was just about um, how do we uh, contact oh, right. tenants in advance yeah. um, before the visit to ensure that they are if, and since they have reported the fault in the first. Yeah, where we miss it, we we try and keep appointments um, yeah, as, as much as possible. And if someone's not available um, when we arrive, we do follow, we do make follow up visits. Um, it's not in all cases is it the tenant that reports the repair. Some people get some assistance to report repairs. And so we'll li liaise with supports 
um, to help us gain, gain access. In extreme cases, um, we have had to do a, a legal forced entry to, to make repairs and um, make, make good um, any, any um, particular issues or with, particularly where there's um, health and safety concerns around electrical or um, gas installations. Um, and you did also ask a question about rent loss through voids. Um, there's, there, yeah, it's been trending. It's been trending up um, slightly, but I think there's been um, over the last few, over the last um, year, we've had an increase after a, after a bit of a hiatus. We've had an increase in activity in terms of people moving. I think that kind of covers it over the last five, last few quarters of why that's trended trended up. Um, but also we've had inc increases in um, the number of properties as well with new builds. So the, the actual stock as a whole is increasing. I can look into what that is proportionally for you and come back to that, come back with that information. I know it was just I wondered previously when we've had reports at committee um, that properties were being left vacant for longer because of COVID and then yeah. that added to your void and I'd asked previously if it was possible but, since that was due to COVID could you um, have, get that money refunded from one of the COVID funds rather than it coming out of housing revenue? Um, I think we've examined we've examined that it's not always it's it's not always been possible to tie everything back to um, the direct effects of COVID. There's some of it's more indirectly affected in terms of um, yeah, yeah, the access to trades, the availability of trades and things like that. So it's not uh, it's not as simple as maybe making a direct comparison that um, this is the COVID impact, which is why this void has taken longer. Um, but uh, it is something that we're working on. Hi, hi Mark, I see your hands up there and you come. Uh, thanks, Graham. Roy's covered a large um, part of it. Um, <clears throat> it's worth us taking it back and having a conversation around that, uh, Angela. I think, I mean, um, some of the issues around um, Equalities, for example, you could make the, the argument that um, how we choose to spend the element of the HRA that provides foot and support, for example, to tenants. So to what extent we choose to do that or invest in that does actually have a direct impact in terms of equalities and beneficial outcomes for those that are more vulnerable in society. I think the, the carbon clever uh, capture one, I think, is probably something that would be possibly more relevant when we're talking about decisions around capital investment in stock. So particularly where we can say, look, you know, we're spending X million pounds a year this year on double glazing or external wall insulation, for example. So that directly benefits not only in terms of carbon reduction, but in terms of the lowering of the costs to live in the property. And so there's a beneficial impact there. I think the challenge is because I've written any number of these reports in, in my life, particularly on the hoof and you're in a hurry, uh, that sometimes uh, you just miss uh, a certain element of um, thinking around how could you actually hang something on the back of that. Um, but I think from, from my perspective, it's often easier to do when you're talking about the capital side of things rather than just the day-to-day -day spend that you've always got to do. Um, but I think just from those examples, and from those you heard from Rory, there's, uh, there's, some, there's some ground for us to perhaps expand that out a bit in, in, in the future. Um, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Any further questions, members? OK, well, I think we're asked to, to note this report and consider it. So thank you for that. Moving mm -hmm. on. Um, moving on to agenda item six, the garages report. And I think that probably comes back to you again, Rory. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Um, the garages report is mostly to um, open this, a bit of discussion around um, the the um, garages estate in Dingwall and Seaforth. I think um, we can acknowledge that it's been a ne neglected part of our portfolio for some time. And um, what I'm looking to do with this report is um, essentially gain some views from members around um, yeah, investment priorities and some of the concerns 
around the around the garage estate in Dingwall and Seaport. The, in the table, um, I've listed all of the locations of garages. I've, in, I've excluded garage sites where we have um, ground that people pitch their own garage on. These are these are only sites where we have council built garages on. Um, so the majority of them are um, understandably in in Dingwall, um, and you'll see that. Each site has got a um, a rating which is related to the um, it, it's more related to what we would see as an investment priority. It's related to the demand and um, condition of the of the garages in that site in that particular site. And um, so, out with that, um, you know, we are doing some work around ensuring that we get the uh, allocations for the 65 people who are waiting for garages in Big Wall and Seaport, which would bring around 30,000 pounds in uh, per year if we could allocate to each of those each of those individuals. Might not be possible to get to all of them because um, some areas, might, some, some of the areas that they're interested in might not have a garage available. But um, I'm open to any questions that members might have on garages and uh, hope to be able to furnish you with answers. Yeah, well, if you recall, it was myself that I'd asked for this report to come to committee and I'm pleased to see it here because there's a substantial amount of money that we could be making from these properties, which we clearly aren't making. And I suppose if there are 99 voids and 65 demands, the first question has to be why? Um, let's get them, them filled up. Uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and the other thing I would raise at this moment is that certainly for some of these garages, Rory, I don't see them ever being pressed back into service. They're in a very poor situation. And the ones that I'm thinking of are, are in largely council estates where there is a huge demand for parking. Um, so that, you know, if these garages and, and those locations are just taking up space. Is there anything to stop us knocking them down and creating additional car parking space, which is always a source of contention anytime I'm talking to people? Um, so I suppose those are the, the two issues. You know, if there are if there are 15, uh, where are we? There's the high ones. Eight voids in, in West Drive and five people want them, then can we have a report coming back to the next committee that shows that number down to three? Um, so that we can see that the, the dispersal of them. I, I dare say COVID has held us back, but I, I think there's been a, a certain um, reluctance, shall I say, to, to allocate these garages uh, over the past year. Angela. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I know that um, I'll bring up again, it says in the implications, there's no uh, resource implications from this. And Rory, you mentioned that if they were all allocated, there would be £30,000 um, of income to that council. But I know that Mark has said previously that some of them are not in a, a suitable state of repair to rent. So therefore, there'll be a cost as well in getting them ready for that um, letting. And so that probably has to be factored into whether or not it's worthwhile um, renting some of these garages out. And Graham's right, there are areas um, where they probably should be knocked down. And while I can understand what, what Graham is saying about um, the land could then be used for parking um, people's cars, but I think that some of these areas where the garages are are quite large although there might not be many garages on them, and perhaps there's other uses that could be made of that land before it's just a uh, change to parking. So um, I know it says uh, 25 locations, but see, when I thought there would have been more garages in that, but mm -hmm. obviously some of them would have been, they must be bought, maybe perhaps they were bought along with the houses, and we wouldn't we wouldn't have that information. Um, and even in Fraser Road, I know that I've reported a garage there that's been, um, the, the door's been broken for a couple of years and it's still not been repaired. And part of that was because they said it was the cost of the repair. So if 
if it's going to be repaired, I think without, and I know that it's not the top priority is garages, but it, it, it does come up an awful lot for each of us as local councillors. So I think they should do, we have to make a decision at some point in whether they are fit for purpose, if, and if not, what should the land be used for? And perhaps it's not just down to us as local members to make that decision. If we're, you know, they're talking about the community being involved in decision making and place making, and um, then perhaps there needs to be some involvement with, you know, residents in the area too. So thank you, Chair. Thanks, Andrew. Yep, I agree with what you say. Um, I, I, Rory, I don't know if you want to come back on it, but before you do, is, is it, would it be okay to ask for this to come back to our next committee in February? Um, with with an update of where we are and a hopefully improving position as we move forward, and that, that's well, three months, three four months away. Uh, so I'd like to ask for that. Mark, or oh, sorry, Rory, do you want to come back? Um, yeah, the, just um, in terms of your questions around garages taking up space and um, you know perhaps being taken down to increase parking, it certainly is something that we we do here in the communities. Um, obviously, there's a bit of a cost involved in demolishing a garage, but there's also a cost involved in managing our estates. And if if the amenity of our estates is not is is not fit in one way or another, then then um, surely there's some action that we can take. And if that means that um, you know we could take down a garage or two to increase the parking amenity. Then and that's what the community wants. Then um, it's certainly something we would explore. Um, in terms of the Fraser Road garage, I'm going to look into that, um, Councillor McLean, and um, see why that's not been repaired. If it's been reported over a number of years, um, it's not something that um, I find particularly favourable. If if part of our estate is in poor condition, um, I don't think it really sets the tone for how we want to manage our estates. So I'll follow that up directly and come back to you. Um, and I'll certainly um, provide an updated report for the February committee. Um, I'll do that at the same time as the garage rents report, because around February is when we'll be asking members to approve the, um, the updated rent model for the garages as well. OK, uh, Mark. Uh, many thanks. Um, part of the challenge with this is making sure that garages across the piece, as well as within Seaforth and Dingwall, actually wash their face at nine and a half quid a week. I think there's at least a, a valid question or discussion to be had around that, around the level of um, rent charge and uh, around the level of investment required in these buildings, both on a day-to-day a -day revenue maintenance basis, so that the kind of situation that Rory was referring to there in response to Angela about garage door and need a repair gets fixed, but also so that we allow enough money over time uh, to be able to uh, uh, invest in capital spend terms, if indeed that's what we decided to do. So one of the things that's certainly uh, on my um, list of to do things over the course of the next year is actually a general um, review of um, DHRA in terms of uh, capital programme and the condition of stock and what is core stock, what isn't, and that will include as a key, key part of that um, garages. And so we'll have a we'll have a look into that theme on a more strategic basis as part of that process, and that will take place over the next couple of years. But in the meantime, uh, I'm perfectly happy with all the comments I've heard um, today about what we need to be doing um, with these garages. I think Graham, you make a good point. Actually, in some cases, part of the answer might be uh, drop them and turn it into parking. In other cases, it might be drop them and turn it into housing if it allows for it, and there is a demand there to uh, to do that. Um, and you know, uh, goodness knows, land is hard enough to come across in the Highlands. Uh, surprisingly, so actually, for someone who's uh, come into the Highlands from outside of the Highlands, when you consider the population is against land mass, um, but sadly, the uh, concentration of ownership is a, a big issue. So we need to be looking uh, in terms of housing delivery at the resources the council has itself, both on the HRA and on other land that the council owns that isn't HRA, and to maximise our opportunities for housing development in that in that sense. So I think um, that's definitely the case. I suppose just to uh, finish on the point I started off on in terms of rents, um, you know, I suppose 
the question I put back to you is, do you want us to keep coming back with, or well, we could put it up two or three percent this year, year on year and year? Or do you want us to come back and actually say, do you know what? We're just chucking good money after bad here. And if we're actually going to do this properly, this is what the size of the investment need is so that it washes its face and we bring everything back up to uh, to some form of standard again. And I think that would be one of the options we look at as well as saying, well, or actually, do we, in the alternative, decide to come out of that market or whatever? But I think we need to do that piece of analysis around it. And it might be that that then means that we have to come back and say, well, you need to jack your rents up more than that in order to make it work. And I'm quite open to whatever the answer needs to be on that. But I do think it's a sort of strategic review, both on the uh, uh, Seafoot and Dingwall level, but also on a, a cross council basis as well. Uh, thanks, Graham. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But I mean, the, 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 the pleasing aspect of that, to this is that most of the ratings are green. Um, yeah. which demonstrates that they are potentially in decent condition. And and if we can get 65 of them off our hands and be earning 40 odd quid a month for each of them, then that would seem to me to give us a bit of leeway for future spend. Yeah, well, I think we just look at the maths of it, Graham, and say, you know, what actually makes it sustainable in the long term rather yeah. than just sort of doing a patch and mend and a bodge up and a one or two percent rise each year. Actually, we grab we grasp this properly and do a proper analysis of what's needed to make it sustainable or or whatever, but we come back to you at least with a decent amount of information so you can have an informed discussion around it. Yeah, that would be really useful. Thanks very much for that both. Um, so, where am I? We are invited to consider the information provided with a view to prioritising future investment at garage sites and we look forward to the next committee's report. Thanks both. Um, we move on then to uh, agenda item seven, place-based investment funds. Um, Di is with us today. Um, I think I'm just going to open that up to the floor. I think it's self-explanatory um, and, and look for members' questions. I think we were all pretty much in, in agreement that these, this is the way we wanted to go. We wanted to be able to establish a sense of well-being in our communities, and we felt that local council officers, if you like, or village officers would be the way to do that. We're well aware that this is not a task for community councils, but is in fact a task for development groups in the different in the different areas of the ward. Um, and we, I think, will be looking to move forward today if this is agreed to invite expressions of interest from people who would like to be involved uh, with these schemes. Um, in terms of the investment in play parks, I think we've all been going on for some time about uh, play parks and how we need improvement. Uh, I, I believe, uh, Mark, you may know more than me that a report comes to committee this month outlining the, the additional funds given to the Highlands and, and in our case to Dingwall Seaforth area. So if we can put uh, some money on top of that to try and make a, a decent job of the many play parts we have, then I think that's very worthwhile. And the last one was the supporting business to the tune of around 10,000. Neither of, uh, uh, of Dingwall nor uh, Muravord have, I think, I hope I'm not, demeaning anyone here have, have functional business um, associations and we think that's integral to moving the town forward. All four of us are very interested in having a, a vision for Dingwall and I think that this could be contributed to by, by any sort of business uh, community if there is interest out there and this is a, a small way in which we could support the setting up of these groups. So that's the thinking behind the schemes. Um, I'll open it up again. Anyone want to wish to make a comment? Angela, you're on mute. I know. I wish I, my husband wishes I was always on mute, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just getting that off. Anyway, yes, Chair. Yeah, I think you probably covered a, a lot of, um, of what we've talked about. Um, over uh, the last uh, few years. And I think this space, um, place-based investment fund um, deals with the, the four main harms of COVID and 
um, you know, and and much of that is also about um, well-being and loneliness and anxiety. And and um, I think that the kind of village officer that we're kind of looking at this investment from community groups is is really good. And I think as councillors, we've been frustrated for some time over the lack of progress on some of the smallest of tasks ever been done um, in the community um, by the services due to the restriction of their budgets and they've laid staff and resources and have a challenging time uh, trying to deliver on the, the pub public's expectations. And a number of our communities have had relied on volunteers to do some of these cleanup tasks and in path improvements and, and, and other repairs. And they, they have done that um, with good, good heart and with support from um, ourselves as local members. And that sometimes they, they get taken from for granted as well by the public and they, and they get treated. I know um, one in particular in Maryborough who has a, an award. Um, you know, he was asked by the public, was the council paying him to do the work? And that, of course, was not the case. But I think that this is the start of a really good um, process through the Community Empowerment Act. And, and as we move forward to the disaggregated budgets and participatory budgeting where communities will not only have a say but can directly have the power to achieve their own ambitions um, which might not always um, dovetail with what Highland Council's uh, priorities are. I believe this is a first step towards driving positive change and to help to deal with many of the inequalities in our, in our communities which COVID-19 has shown shone really a bright light on over the past two years. It's shown where, where some communities have thrived and that they've got that network of support and others have not done as well. And um, I think that you know this, this is a, a, a good step forward. Clay areas, as you say, many of the wards have uh, looked at making improvements and, and we, have, as you've mentioned before, Chair, should also receive some funding from the Scottish Government uh, through their promise of the 100 days in office and supporting business. I mean, if we don't have businesses in our communities, then um, our high streets will, will die and uh, we have always felt that we should be supporting them. And um, I can only agree with the comments that you've made. I don't know if Alistair's got something to say. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Can I come in? Yeah, of course. Yeah, sorry, I, uh, I have nothing to add. I just uh, totally agree with the, the the comments made by yourself, Graham, and and, uh, and Angela. And uh, we've got a good opportunity to work together and move things forward. Thank you. OK, I'll just check with Daya that I haven't missed anything there, Daya. Is there any, any more that needs to be said at this point? I don't think so. I think everything's yeah. covered. Just go to recommendation. Yeah. yeah, recommendations are there in front of you in terms of items one, two and three, the village and town amenities, play parks and support of businesses. Can we agree those? Agreed. Thank you. Um, and move on to eight. Daya, it's you, I think, Dingwall. And if thing will come in good fund, quarter yeah. two monitoring. Um, the reports in front of you, along with the appendix giving the outturn for this month, were due to um, come in on target with the budget set. The works continue in Dingwall Town Hall with their property colleagues continuing to um, see what work requires to be done, and they're also putting bids in for capital funding, along with the funds that we've put aside from the common good and the town centre funding, which we have um, and we're working to spend at the moment on the roof. I think a full report should come to the February meeting. By that time, we should have results of the tenders and maybe some work will have started. I certainly yes. hope so. <laughs> OK, thank you for that, Di. Um, all right. Can we just agree that? Do Can we? we just agree that? Yeah, then, members, agreed. thank you. Agreed. Um, agenda item 10, since we've done nine, is the Inner Murray Firth proposed local development plan. I believe we have Tim Stott with us. So, can I hand over to you, Tim? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, so, can I just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, we can. You can, great. Okay. I, I have a, a short. Um, 
PowerPoint as well. Um, thanks, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Uh, this item seeks your approval of the local detail of the new Inner Money Firth Local Development Plan as it affects your ward. I'm joined on the call by Julianne Bain, who will help me talk you through the, that local uh, detail. But first of all, members, if I can just remind you of where we are in the plan process. Uh, we came to you about a year ago asking you to sign off on uh, various options, policy and development site options. Uh, and that was included in a document called the Main Issues Report, which was issued for public consultation at the beginning of this, this year. Um, we we're now at this yellow box. Uh, so we've we've had the, the, uh, this um, the reports uh, before you summarise the comments that we've had. Um, this is uh, you're one of the six local city committees that cover the plan area, and we're we're obviously re reporting back to all of them. The there's um, plan wide content to this document as well, and that will be reported to the the economy and infrastructure committee uh, which meets on the 2nd of December so what we're asking you to do in the papers is to consider the comments we've had in on the main issue support and agree uh, the content of the proposed plan a this is the the plan area as a whole you can see it goes up as far as Tain as far east of, as uh, Nairn and uh, a fair way south on the 82 as well your portion of the plan area is in here uh, you'll see that there's uh, yeah. several main s settlements uh, within your p p plan area, but that's just. A... just excuse me, Tim. Just a sec. Both councillors are trying to attract my Sorry. attention here. All right. Sorry, can you see? Just, when you're seeing Tim, uh, as you can see, and you want us to go back to our papers, or are you putting that? Sorry, on can, I sorry. I thought I'd share my screen. Apologies. I will try again. Hopefully you're seeing it changing now. That's it. Yep. Sorry about that. I don't think you, you've you've missed much on the early early slides, so I will keep on going. Uh, right. So that's where we are in the plan the process. Um, a that's the plan area as a whole, showing that the plan boundary. This is your portion. Let me get the laser pointer on. This is your portion of plan area over here. Dingwall's this blue blob, um, Maryborough, Conanbridge, um, Tor, North Keswick. Uh, so that's your portion of the wider plan area. A, the, we have what's called a settlement hierarchy. So this is where we direct most growth. So we, we uh, through the plan process, we're seeking to direct most growth to the, the highest tier of uh, places. So you see that uh, Dingwall and uh, Muir Board within your um, your committee boundary uh, are two of the most uh, highest tier places. Uh, Conan Bridge and North to North Keswick are in tier tier two, Maribor in tier three, and uh, Tor in in tier four. Within your papers in Appendix One, you'll see the detail maps for each of those six places, and we'll get onto that local detail very soon. Just to very briefly tell you what the uh, how many comments we had in, in on the main issues report. This was the initial consultation draft of the document. Uh, we had a record number of comments on the uh, the plan. That, that's a record for any um, local development plan across Highland. Um, so over 1,400 comments received on it, uh, which is I think good given it was a mainly online plan and an online uh, consultation that we undertook. Um, so we yeah we use a, a mixture of um, uh, postcards to every household, social media, online videos. Have quite a few Teams and Zoom meetings with community groups as well. Uh, we actually chased up uh, community councils to get them to put in written comments as well. And we we had paper copy op options available for 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 those who are not online. Um, just this is in section seven of the covering report. We're recommending to you today and asking you to agree, hopefully, uh, that we'd use the same methods of consultation this time around. So the the plan gets reissued this time for formal objections at the beginning of next next year. Uh, so in section seven of the report, you'll see that we're um, seeking approval for the same methods of consultation over a period of eight weeks. We will consider face to face meetings if um, the government allows us to do those at that time. 
Uh, there's an Appendix 2. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to delve into the detail of Appendix 2 or not, but there's these plan-wide general policies, as we call them, uh, in Appendix 2. Th those will be going to the um, ENI committee on the 2nd of December. Uh, it's the ENI committee ha that has the, the, uh, the power, if you like, to decide upon the content of those. However, we're asking each uh, local city committee for their views if they want to record any. So the ENI committee on the 2nd of December can take account of local member views as well so as i say but please please feel free to give us any any views on uh, the detail in appendix two in a in appendix two we've got the um in in light of the comments we've received we're proposing to reorder the the outcomes uh hierarchy the settlement hierarchy is changing but uh, not for any settlements within your uh, committee boundary there's been a lot of debate with the house, the house builders and other bodies about the overall housing uh, targets that we're aiming for. Uh, the government are issuing guidance on this for Highland. Uh, basically, the the government have set a very low figure for Highland. Uh, the house builders would like us to set a, set a very high figure, and uh, the the figure that's going to ENI committee and, and is in appendix two is um, eight and a half thousand for the plan area as a whole. Uh, so so yeah, we we kind of expect a an awful lot of comments both for and against on the the housing totals that we're aiming for i.e the which obviously affects the number of sites we earmark for development within the plan uh, i mentioned this general policy so for example there's one on low low carbon development uh, policy one there's others on self self build as well the as i say the detail of those is contained in appendix two and we'd be happy to receive any uh, local city committee views on those ones uh, the hinterland boundary you may be aware uh, councillors in adjoining committees are have very uh, firm opinions on where the hinterland boundaries are uh, drawn. Uh, there haven't been, well, you, when we came to you the last time, you didn't have any uh, firm views on changing the boundary as it is now. So for your your committee area, there isn't any proposed change for it. Um, what we are asking you to decide on what in the local, each of the local city committees have been asked to decide upon is the local detail if you like and that local detail includes which sites in each uh, main settlement to be marked for development uh, the list of acceptable land uses for each of those identified sites uh, which safe uh, which sites to safeguard from development so we've got, got a there's a green space map for each of the six uh, uh, towns and villages in appendix one and we're asking you to uh, uh, agree uh, which areas are identified as green spaces the importance of, of those is that they those are to be safeguarded from uh, any development proposal so we wouldn't entertain any uh, built development planning applications on those sites Obviously, uh, the other factor is there's a, an indicative housing capacity given for each of the uh, the proposed sites for development. And there's also quite what's called placemaking priorities for each place. So when we get a, a planning application in, in any town or village that's not on an identified site, so obviously we need a framework against which to assess those pro proposals. And that placemaking priority text is how we, um, how we assess those other uh, proposals. So say so we'll, we'll, we'll get into the, the local detail now. The six main settlements, uh, Julianne Bain, who's also on the call, will talk you through the detail for Dingwall. I'll start with Conan Bridge. Um, hopefully you can see the, the screen changing there. Down the right hand side is the list of uh, sites we're recommending uh, are retained within the plan. And uh, uh, the middle columns, the um, range of acceptable uses. And down the right hand column, an indicative 10 year housing capacity for these sites. You'll have seen that uh, within Conan, uh, we, uh, at the request of uh, local members, the former petrol filling station site is uh, is back in the plan. Uh, even though SEPA may have concerns con concerns about it, we are going to um, include that within the uh, the new version of the plan that's going to be issued next year. The Pes Pescanova fish processing plant is in. That's got a planning permission, albeit subject to flood works, which I think are, are committed and perhaps underway. Uh, the Druthy Duck, the old um, former pub and adjoining land is, again, uh, planning permission subject to flood uh, flood scheme. 
the uh, Braves of Conan, uh, CBO1, where my red cursor is at the moment. That's the final phase, which uh, has got a planning application pending, might even be granted. There were flood issues with it, which is why it hadn't come forward up until now. Uh, it looks from the layout that they've addressed those flood issues. So that's why that one's been recommended to be taken forward. Uh, the, the the principal new site, if you like, would be a, a next phase for the Braves of Conan site, where I've outlined with the red marker pan here. We think that's closest to the school and uh, the retail shop as well. So we think that's probably the best option. Uh, albeit I, I do uh, recall uh, councillors expressing a concern about the A835 junction. We will, uh, we are meeting, we're having a meeting with Transport Scotland about the, uh, the capacity of the A835 and the other trunk roads through the plan area and talking to them about what, um, what requirements can be placed on any developer of any of these sites. So as I say, that, 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 that there will be a, a list of, um, of texts for what, for any site that's taken forward, what the developer will be required to do. So we could get them to assess the impact that any development of this CBO2 site may have on that uh, A835 junction. Uh, these two sites, for big, sorry, the, the big red X members means that we're, we're not recommending, uh, re recommending that these sites are taken forward. Uh, this is the schoolhouse uh, belt site, which has got woodland issues. Tullock uh, own it, I believe. Um, I've not taken it forward up until now. Uh, and this is the uh, Riverford site, which um, went to pre-application recently. Uh, we, we, we don't think that these are uh, compare as well compared to the Brazil Conan site and in overall housing numbers we don't need uh, any extra sites. So we basically we're trying to concentrate on these um, what were called brownfield sites or previously developed sites uh, uh, closer to the village centre and uh, we think that on balance against range planning factors the Brazil Conan site is better than the the, the other two marked with a red X. Um, I'll now pass on to uh, Julianne Bain, who will take you through the detail for Dingwall. Just, bef just before you oh, do that, um, I've got both councillors have their hands up, so I think okay. we'll, we'll go for questions for this specific locality. Okay. So, uh, Alistair. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Tim, for, for, for the report. Just to highlight again the junction, the importance of that junction and the 835. Uh, last Thursday, uh, there was a very, very near miss, and it could have been uh, catastrophic. There was a car in the middle there. It had about five kids in it, and there was a lorry coming hurtling down the road. And I know it's driver error, but it, it, it's the speed that the vehicles come. And I go back to what I said the last time, and I accept that COVID, we were in COVID, but when there was a 40 mile an hour, speed limit on that road when they were working on the road. It was absolutely safe. Nobody had a problem. And even at ferry times when when he had the traffic going to the Aleppo for the for the Western Isles ferry. Again, I I accept COVID was there and there wasn't so much traffic on the road, but it was peaking at three o'clock and ten o'clock in the three o'clock in the afternoon and ten o'clock in the morning. And it felt safe at this moment in time. That junction is it's you know, there's been fatalities on it. And it's mm. one that needs addressing before we have any more housing uh, passed in, in, in Conan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alistair. Angela? Uh, similar, Chair, there have been a number of fatalities there. And Alistair's right. When the Transport Scotland were doing work on the road and the, the speed limit was reduced, it made a big difference. It made it safer for cars to pull out because the cars and vehicles come far too fast coming down the hill. And the option is not for all the traffic to be diverted through the village of Conanbridge and Maryborough in order to go to the roundabout at Maryborough, um, because that is not uh, suitable for people. And my other question, Tim, was really about um, the school belt, and um, uh, which is CB05 and the CB07. And both of these previously had or were able to put in applications. The CB05 it lapsed um so would they the developer be able to come back and put in an application um since it had previously uh, been agreed and cb07 i think it is um they have an application in at the moment and that is that within 
their timescale and how would that be viewed? Would that be viewed under the present local development plan or given if we make a decision today, will that be under the new local? Because this will have material yeah. consideration after we have agreed it. Yeah. Yes. OK. Thank you, for, uh, members. Yeah, the the um, the what we can for the CBO2 site, the uh, Braze of Conan site, we can certainly insist that the the developer of that site, uh, as and when a, a planning application is lodged, produces a document called a transport assessment, which would have to look at the junction capacity and the safety of that uh, junction. Uh, you may be aware, members, if you've attended the, the Transport Scotland meetings on the tour to North Keswick section of the A9, where a 50 mile an hour limit was uh, actually looked at as an option. Uh, if you read the, the summary of the reports on that, the, the, there was a, not a local consensus in favour of that for that particular piece of the, the, the A9. So, uh, but, but uh, yeah, it, I mean, I think it's it's hopeful that Transport Scotland they themselves put forward uh, that as a reasonable option. So, uh, I think I think um, a, what uh, say if if and when a planning application is lodged on CBO2, then the uh, the transport assessment can certainly have a look at that. And and I, th I think we will we'll maybe use this this plan going back out again to test whether the, there's local community support for it as well. Because you know as I say, certainly uh, Transport Scotland would be more likely to have a look at a um, that option if there's uh, local community support for it. Um, in terms of the what happens with the adopted local development plan, yes, you're right. The uh, the the adopted local development plan will still be the adopted plan uh, until this new one is completely finished. So in terms of the legal weight, if you like, to be attached to the the old 2015 plan relative to, to this new one, then the the old one, the 2015 one still uh, is more important in making any planning application decision or if there's any appeal as well, uh, any uh, DPA reporter or the courts would give greater weight to the 2015 plan. So that's why um, the pre application it's not a planning application, I don't think, yet on CBO 07. It's what's called a pre-planning application proposals in. And I think the, the landowners have woken up, if you like, to, to, to the fact that the council is thinking of changing the uh, its its plan and uh, changing its endorsement of development on that field. So yeah, so so it means that they've they've basically got another year or so to try and get their uh, proposal through. Uh, but obviously the the CBO five one that there's a woodland issue and uh, I think the you know the 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 desire to protect woodland is perhaps in increased in the meantime if you like so I think I think even even if um, uh, new planning applications were to come in on CBO five and CBO seven I don't think the even though they are still zoned for de development in the, the 2015 plan I don't think the council officers at least would be as supportive of it as we have been in the past so yeah the if you approve this local detail today then yeah it it, it will become a material planning consideration when we issue the proposed plan which won't be until next next March but but yeah it, it's it's a material planning consideration but it's not until part of the what's called the approved development plan uh, until it's fully finished okay thank you Tim I think you can take it as unanimous that all of us all four of us have the same concerns about that junction and I'm glad to see that the issues have been taken seriously. OK, we'll move on right. to Dingwall then. OK, uh, Julianne, can you um, take over at this point? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, afternoon, members. Um, in terms of Dingwall, uh, if we look first at the recommended housing allocations, um, we're recommending that we reallocate the majority of the housing sites in Dingwall North. So that's DW02, 03 and 01 as we work as we work um, west east across the screen. Um, primarily because they're all central sites and they've all either got active interest in them or indeed they're actively being developed at present. Uh, and that would also allow for the final stretch of uh, the road, uh, the connecting road across the north of Dingwall to be completed. 
Um, DW11, Upper Dock Carty, we're not recommending that site to go forward as an, as an allocation, um, or indeed, sorry Tim, over in the east uh, sites, DW19 and 20, or over at Old Edmonton Road. Um, there are three sites, there are three large edge of settlement sites. Uh, they may well be suitable for housing development in the much longer term, uh, but uh, it's recommended that we concentrate development on more central sites for the short to medium term. Um, other housing sites, uh, if we zoom back out a little bit, Tim. Uh, other housing sites, um, at DW12 Macdonald Road um, is constrained by steep ground and 14 and 16 are, uh, are constrained by a single track road access. Um, DW10 Carty Bray. Um, Tim, could you move on to the next slide briefly? Mm -hmm. So DW10, um, we're recommending that it comes forward with a smaller modified site boundary um, and we're suggesting that it is shown as a potential site for the redevelopment of St Clement's School. Um, can you go back to the previous slide please Tim? Uh, and can you zoom in at, uh, at the beside the business park? Uh, sorry, Tim. Can you zoom in a little bit around O um, eight? Are you trying? I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I can zoom in that close, but I'll try. Oh, sorry, that was you zoomed in. <laughs> yes, I think that's as far as it goes. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, we're also recommending that the land to the east of the business park is taken forward as one single allocation for business and industrial uses. So that's amalgamating. Um, the existing allocation at DW8, which um, Tim is hovering the hand over at the moment, and adding the land to the north of it at DW17 and 18. So providing that as one single allocation for business and industrial land. Um, over on the east of the town, DW09 Craig Road, uh, recommending it's taken forward as a community allocation for green space. Um, DW06 and 07 are the two Riverside sites recommending that they continue to be allocated as they, pre, as they currently are. Um, and finally, uh, just to note that in the placemaking priorities, uh, there is now a reference being made to the potential for a new community woodland at Knockbean Farm. That's everything from me, members, for Dingwall. Thanks, thank you. Uh, Alistair? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it was just DW, uh, if you could maybe zoom in like a DW, that, that land to the DW8, the business park, the, the sites of the business park, you're, you're, you're wanting to bring them forward. I mean, we all as members are frustrated that there are sites on the existing business park and they can't be utilised because of SEPA and, and they just can't get planning at all. And we're in discussion with HIE, we're in discussion with our, our colleagues at, at planning as well. Um, you know, it seems a bit rich we're coming, coming forward DW8, DW17 and 18 for development of that when the existing site there, uh, we, we can't get any, any, any businesses and we have businesses who are willing and want to move into the area and can't because of constraints regarding the, the buns on that. And I think you know you have to work together with them to ensure that that maybe you can put pressure on them to to ensure that the, the buns are are are, are uh, modified and to comply with the new regulations. Because what's been happening ha has been that HIE has been selling sites, and the blunt reality is they haven't been putting the money back in to keeping the the, the development going there. And uh, they've got buns there that there's vegetation and that. Uh, going out to them and uh, we're still waiting for a, a report uh, again frustratingly uh, an awful long time we were promised this maybe five six weeks ago and we're still awaiting a, a, a report that HIE have done on the business park so 
I think it's very important that that uh, um, we all work together to ensure that we can get the existing site uh, operational because you know we are in recovery mode. There are people wanting to move into Digwell. They've got apprentices. These companies that want to move in have have got a substantial amount of apprentices who have, who have just joined them. So we want to encourage them to move in, but you know uh, we need. I think we need to work work together to to ensure that we can achieve that. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Angela. Yes, I would like to echo that, Chair. I mean, um, I know that uh, DW17 and DW08, um, that's that's been allocated for new space, and and that that's good. But we've all been, all four local members have had meetings with um, different officials regarding the Dingo Business Park, and it has an impact later on in some of the other communities, because even Maidaburra um, mentions um, MBO4 um, um, as their concern and that that's going to become more um, industrial and business-like. And, and part of that reason is we have businesses that want to come and, and be based in Dingwall and the surrounding area, and they, they need to have the proper facilities. And, and unless the issues at the Dingwall Business Park are addressed, it will have further impact on other communities in our ward. Thank you. Okay. Have you any anything to say about that, Tim? Or yeah, uh, certainly. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I mean, I think I think uh, yeah. You know, I would agree that uh, trying to uh, investigate the. Uh, sorry, I I don't know the detail, but I'm guessing that um, the point was being made that the flood bonds uh, that protect the business park are not bona fide, or CEPA don't re recognise them as bona fide flood bonds. So uh, certainly, certainly, the if if and when the uh, um, the flood scheme is taken forward, then uh, it, uh, any flood scheme normally looks at the catchment as a whole. So it would have to look at the you know, it would be pointless in doing flood defence works in certain parts of the catchment that weren't matched by uh, checking the condition of existing bonds in other parts. So um, I would be hopeful that the, the the wider flood scheme could look at the uh, the the condition of the bonds that pr uh, protect the existing uh, business park, and it should be possible, uh, perhaps jointly funded, perhaps by HIE and and uh, the council through uh, 80%. A government funding for a flood scheme to to look at the condition of those bonds and perhaps ensure that they are uh, recognised by SEPA as uh, offering a, a, the correct degree of protection. But yeah, I mean this this plan you'll see that the um, what we call the settlement development area boundary or this white line it does enclose all those um, as you say vacant but serviced sites uh, and yeah. The first port of call, if you like, for new business or industrial development should be on those sites. So, so yeah, there, there, there isn't anything in this local development plan that would uh, in, in, inhibit the um, development of those uh, vacant and service sites. But yeah, I think the 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 way forward is to is to uh, do a detailed design for the flood scheme that has a look at the condition of the existing bonds and and seeks to prove them sufficiently that SEPA would uh, recognise them as as, uh, as as sound. Yeah, that's helpful because that's exactly what we've been looking for. But as Alistair rightly says, we've, we've been promised the report for a long time now and uh, there's no sign of it. Um, Julianne? Uh, thanks, Chair. Just echoing what Tim had said there, you're, you're correct, Tim, in saying uh, the bund isn't. Um, my understanding is that the way the bund is, it's not at a, in a way that it's able to be adopted by the council. And there's quite a, I think there's quite a lot of money that would need to be spent on it in order for it to become adopted. Um, the last time I spoke to Colin Heil about it, which is within this last month, um, there has been some work done on it um, and it's so obviously members you're still waiting to hear the outcome of any of the investigations but as Tim has already said um, the business park is within their settlement development area and taking forward a new uh, modified allocation there means that um, as and when hopefully any work is taken forward then the plan will be supportive 
um, of business and industrial development in that part in that part of the town. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, thanks, Chair, for allowing me back in. DW10, where there's a proposal maybe to have a, a, a use in Clemens facility there, surely the buns would have to be rectified as well, because that would have a, an effect on, on, on that side as well. So hence the importance of trying to work together. Thank you. Yes, uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, yes, so certainly the, 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 the flood uh, the new flood scheme it, it will will eat into DW10. So yes, the 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 design of Saint Saint Clement School, if it goes there, and any other development uh, will 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 have to uh, safeguard the land uh, required for the flood um, flood bund. Uh, sorry, flood flood scheme, which will be you know uh, there'll be some sort of widened watercourse and flood defences either side of it. Yeah, you'll see if if you look at the agenda, you'll see we've got St Clements coming up mm, very mm, soon on the agenda. Mm. It'll be interesting to see how Robert responds to that. Mm. Any other comments or, or where are we go where are we going now, Tim? We're going uh chair to Maryborough. Yeah. Um yeah, a this this is slightly faster members. Uh, we're trying to again draw back the scale of developments relative to what's in the 2015 plan, uh, because uh, there are uh, land ownership issues, i.e., the the landowners at um, of the Maryborough expansion area that I'm outlining with the red curse. So, haven't over the years haven't been able to agree with each other as to getting that uh, site serviced and um, made available for de 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 development. Um, however, the, the Highland Small Communities Housing Trust, which are now called the Communities Housing Trust, have got a small area of land which they own, which can be accessed uh, with a minor improvement at this MBO2 site. So we're recommending that's included in the new plan. Uh, the, there's the, uh, the northern bit of the former primary school has got applying permission for a, a, a men's shed. So we're endorsing that community uh, proposal. Uh, the other site is is fully built out or, or will be fully built out by the time we issue the uh, the plan at the beginning of next year. So, so we won't be showing any fully built out sites on the new plan. Uh, we're not endorsing uh, the big brand site to the south south of the village because uh, in overall housing numbers t terms, we don't need it. We are, though, we, we think that there should be, apart from the um, the Communities Housing Trust affordable development, we think there should be some uh, private housing land identified for development. So we and we understand that the, the ransom issues uh, have been resolved to, to the extent that the former planning permission for 30 units off Birch Drive can come forward now. So we are uh, uh, proposing the inclusion of that site. Uh, so north of the Maryborough roundabout on the way into Dingwall, um, the Dingwall Ocean Marts approached us at the beginning of the, this new plan process and asked us to consider uh, a business and industrial uh, land allocation, a new allocation for quite a large area of land, both the red site and the green site. Uh, we uh, issued this for consultation. We didn't have an awful lot of comments back on it, um, but yes, I, I think I think uh, we. But as I say, given the, the issues that we've just talked about in um, Dingwall and the uh, certainly the lack of uh, suitable business land and industrial land on the Black Isle as well, uh, we, we, we think this is uh, worthy of being included in in the in the new new plan, but you'll see that we've we've uh, stopped short of recommending the the upper the upper fields because of the uh, visual impact really that the uh, any development further up the slope would have as you're dropping down towards the roundabout on the 835. So, yeah, we've we've uh, you know you can see that we've we are, as officers at least we are recommending that just the lower slopes are included for a mixture of business and industrial development on that land. Uh, I think previously councils were concerned about the active travel link that goes along the frontage of the site being severed. Uh, the, the 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 detailed layout would have to um, preserve that active travel link and ensure a safe uh, way in which um, vehicles could uh, go over that link. Um, the 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 big new or uh, well, fairly new uh, auction mark shed is this building here, so that you can get your bearings. And these are the the other farm sheds. Higher up the hill, so yeah, the idea, members, is to is to just to control any built development below where those that line of existing uh, farm sheds are at the moment. Any questions on Maryborough? Alistair. 
Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Chair, again. Uh, just again, access uh, to the, your proposals there uh, from the cattle mart. There's, uh, the entrance to the cattle mart uh, there in the last three weeks, there's been two fairly serious accidents. Um, uh, the last one resulting in injury. Uh, and again, it's the speed of the vehicle going in there uh, and, and access in there uh, would be a major issue uh, for me, the, the safety and how, how we get it, whether you have a roundabout or, 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 or what. But uh, again, just like the junction 825, we have to watch that because, uh, as I say, there's been, there's been two uh, fairly serious accidents, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the last three weeks. Uh, and it happened at peak times as well. And uh, what has been noticeable uh, since the new traffic lights actually went in uh, from Greenhill Street, uh, just as you can get to Dingwall there, there's pedestrian crossings there, which are great, but it does slow it down. And at peak times, you can have the queues going right back uh, way past the, 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 the mart and people are just beginning to take chances. And that's what would uh, give me cause for uh, just that, that we need to have a look at the the, the access uh, more, more closely again, Tim. Thank you. Sure. Uh, sorry, Chair, is it okay if I could give an answer yes, on that point? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think we've we've talked talked talk before. So certainly for a, a development of this size, you, you know, I mean, it is a large site, so uh, the developer would have to do a transport assessment to assess the impact on the local road network that their development would have, and I think uh, I think. A roundabout, or a, certainly a new T T junction off the um, God was it the A eight six six or two here would would probably be the optimum way. You know, you can maybe have a one way in, one way out. But you know, I, th I, th I think uh, you know we certainly recognise that the existing junction is not uh, is not of sufficient capacity to cope with the with the de development of that wider site. So, so yes, yeah, so, so we, we the we will write into the the list of what a developer's got to do for any of these confirmed sites, and a transport assessment will definitely be included for this this site. Thank you. That's encouraging. Um, where are we off to? Muir of Art. Yep. Muir of Art. Yeah. Um, I'll maybe zoom in because it's quite a small map. Um, yeah, the the, uh, the sorry again, the green ticks uh, other sites we're recommending are taken forward. So the Lock and Core development has got a planning permission already, albeit phased over time. Uh, the uh, sports grounds are being reserved. We had comments uh, asking us to exclude uh, business use, so we we, we um, uh, there was a fear that um, business development could be could happen on the green fields in here. So we've uh, the the list of acceptable uses that we're proposing for this MO3 site exclude business use now. So it's just for uh, community use. Uh, that would though allow if if we ever get the funding for a new um, or enlarged school, then it would still allow uh, we, you know we would judge a a new school to be a community use. So it would allow the uh, the re the rejigging or the or the um, making the existing school bigger on this land in here, but yeah, the, we've, we've in in light of the comments received, we've decided to exclude business as an option for that MO3 site. Uh, Muravod Industrial Estate, we we've talked again about the, the, the I think there is a, a pent up demand for new business and industrial units. Uh, Burton Property Trust, the landowner, came to us at the start of the plan process, offered this piece of land for that type of use. Uh, we think it's worth doing. There, are, there is existing woodland that would be affected. They can maybe just, just about see on the aerial photo there. So uh, there is a woodland issue. And uh, again, the list of what the developer would be asked to do would include new new planting on the outer edge of that site, but as I said, we, we think we, we think that there is a, that there is a need for more business and industrial land, and it's, it seems reasonable to, to locate it next to where it exists now. South of the Cairns site, uh, there's uh, active developer interest in it, uh, and uh, previous planning consents consents as well. It is I know, I know members have made the point, and I think the community council made the point about it, it is. Uh, right at the edge, the edge of the village or town, so that is an uh, you know an issue. But there are uh, there is an existing active travel uh, route into the centre, and there are uh, the the developer will be asked to pay for Im for improvements, in including the the link to uh, Bewley as well. So I think that can help uh, link that site back into the rest of the settlement. 
Cody Road, uh, we're not proposing that these sites are taken forward. There's um, a land land ownership issues, uh, ransom issues, uh, woodland issues as well, drainage issues. So uh, those are um, the reasons why we're not recommending uh, M006 and 07 are taken forward. Uh, Glenord Distillery are looking to, um, uh, well, they, they, they've had pre previous proposals and they've asked us to uh, look at um, possible future expansion within their existing cartilage as well. So we think that's a reasonable thing to, to do. So that's why that's uh, shown with the green tick. The other, other these three big red X's at the northern end of Muravor, these were came through the uh, the call for sites process at the beginning of this new plan. We're, again, we're not short of housing numbers. You know, there's been big planning permissions uh, recently granted um, in the settlement. We don't see a need to add to them. There are various issues uh, with each of the sites, woodland and drainage with MO010, uh, uh, potential ground ground conditions issues with MO09 uh, and uh, Balverde Road. I think there's a, a an amended application in now for fewer um, fewer numbers because they're, they're, they're finding it uh, difficult to, to resolve Solve issues with that site as well. So th those uh, members of the recommendations for Muir of Ord, happy to answer any questions. Okay, Tim, Julianne, thanks very much for the comprehensive run through these proposals. Members, are there any questions? No, no. Angela, no. Yes, Chair, sorry. Um, I wondered, well, I, I'm happy with the recommendations because I, I have been through it already with Tim, um, but I wondered when does a, a town become, a village become a town and a town become a city? Because, um, you know, you've got Muravor down as um, a town um, in the details. So I just wondered, and earlier on you talked about city committees, and I just wondered, what is what is it based on numbers or, or what? Thank you. Yes, Chair. The, uh... Muravod is in the top tier of the settlement hierarchy because it's got good uh, transport links as well. So, you know, the fact that it has a, a sort of rail link uh, is one factor, uh, and and that it has an awful lot of local jobs as well. So it's not it's not purely the uh, the number of houses or the number of people that live within the settlement at the moment. It's uh, in terms of how much what share of future growth any place gets. We've we've uh, tried to take account of how good the transport links are uh, within and from and to that 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 place and as i say what whether you know there's there's any spec capacity in the local school whether there's uh jobs as well whether there's, there's good active travel links as well so there's a, a huge range of factors that we've taken into account in deciding wh uh, which settlement tier each place appears in but as i say it, it's 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 for those transport links and good local jobs uh, the main reasons why we think Muir of Ord is a suitable place to accommodate the future growth, albeit, as I said, there's quite a few red X's on that map, which means that we don't think it should be overwhelmed either. OK, thank you. Alistair? Probably a challenge you there, uh, Tim, that mm -hmm. uh, Conan Bridge has got better uh, transport links than Muir of Ord has, because the complaint that I get from residents in Miravord is they can go to Inverness, fantastic, but not going from Miravord to Dingwall to work unless you have unless you have a car. Whereas in in Conanbridge, you've got buses uh, uh, going all, all all the time, and that's one uh, shortfall there is with uh, with Miravord. No problem going south, but you know, for people who are wanting to go to work in Dingwall before nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they, in, in the morning, they have a they have a real real challenge on their hands, and I've had lots and lots and lots of uh, um, emails uh, over the last nine and a half years uh, to that effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, should people should be able to go by train, I would imagine, but yeah, as I said, the train line might not, uh, the, the times might not suit, and uh, yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, one thing we are putting in again, it wouldn't wouldn't suit an awful lot of people. But yeah, there the, the will be a uh, there was a lot of call for an, a better active travel link between Muravod and Conan. So that the one of the other uh, active travel proposals would be to to add that in 
as well. But, but yeah, and and sorry, the the housing capacity of the Brazer Conan site is quite big. It's probably on a par with the uh, lock and core site. So you know, it, you know, if you look at the the overall number of houses that we're looking at uh, in Conan compared to Muravor, there isn't there isn't an awful lot of um, um, difference, if you like, between the the two the two to totals. Um, members, I, I'm sorry, I, we haven't finished the settlements uh, because your committee boundary overlaps North North Keswick and Tor. I, I'm not sure if you want me to talk about those, Chair. Yeah, please. But just before you so do, okay, um, right. I've got to see Robert has his hand up. Do you want to come in on that, Robert? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, sorry. If I could maybe just come back here on the St. Clement site, um, just to maybe to clarify while uh, Julian and Tim are on the a call before I get into my item, but um, the area that's shown in red there, that is um, out with the flood risk uh, plain. So uh, that's why we're going for that shape of site. So that um, the lower part to the southern part of the site is uh, within the flood risk area, but the, the bit that we're planning to develop on isn't. So, um, and I think the report does uh, allude to that, but maybe just to clarify that, uh, I don't know, Tim or Julian, I've got any comments on that, but that's certainly um, the feedback we've got from the, the major pre-planning application advice that we got. Thank okay, you. thank you for that clarification, Robert. Okay, Tim, if you want to tie it up now. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think your your committee boundary or war boundary overlaps with the western end of North yeah. North Keswick. Just to clarify that the the Broadlands proposal for the Belfield Farm, uh, you see there's red X's on it. We're not uh, recommending that for inclusion within the new plan. We are, however, recommending a, a small expansion to North North Castle. There, there was an old planning permission for a, a golf course and a, a hotel linked to it. It's where the hotel was shown and the uh, other commercial development. Uh, we are uh, recommending that uh, mixed use, including housing, is is earmarked in the new plan on that site. And I think I say that that's very close, if not within your 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 boundary. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any any comments, members on that one? Fine with that. No, not seeing anything. Okay, and finally, uh, the final final slide and settlement members is uh, again your your committee boundary overlaps with Tor. Uh, you'll see a lot of red X's on that map. We are not re recommending as officers that you include uh, the uh, the large expansion that uh, a particular house house builder has. Um, asked us to consider through, through the new plan process. There's also, also you, you, you may be aware, there's been a uh, recent uh, pre-planning application community meetings held as, uh, in, in Tor as well. And but yeah, the, the, uh, the, the recommendation before you in appendix, um, in appendix one is, is, is to not endorse the developers proposals there. Okay. And, that, and that's it, Chair. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you for your time and for the comprehensive way you've gone about it. Angela, you've got your hand up. Yes, Chair. Um, it's just on a uh, tour and I'm, I'm really pleased. I'll get the camera off because it's... Uh, I'm really pleased um, what you're saying because Tour is a community that's split in four uh, because of the A9 and other arterial roads uh, through the village. And, and this is a farming community with strong community connections who know a lot about their history and that of the land um, and over the years being at the community councils I can see how passionate they are about their community and I think that uh, you're correct to only have infill small developments because any big development will overwhelm them and uh, the community don't want that so I'm pleased with the recommendation there chair thanks thanks Angela I think we'd probably all agree with that um OK, members, you have 2.1. You have the recommendations in front of you, 1 to 6. I'm sure you've read them. Do we want to approve those? Yeah, agreed. Yeah, right, agreed. So once again, Tim, Julie, thanks very much for your attendance this afternoon. Um, and we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you. Members, that's two and a half hours. I'm happy to plough on, uh, but do you want a comfort break? Do you want five minutes? or? Up to you. No, you're happy enough. Angela? Angela's hands up, but she's not responding. Sorry, okay. that's up from before. Keep it okay. I'm happy to carry on. Okay, then we'll plow on. Um, 
And that takes us to 11 St. Clement's School, Dingwall. Robert, I think you're going to give us a verbal report on that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, just to uh, update you on uh, where we've got to, I think um, three main areas, um, the two reports that uh, have been to Council in recent months about the capital programme, um, where we are with the uh, identification of the site to uh, take forward for the new school, and then maybe look at some of the next steps and uh, actions that we've got to take forward in the coming weeks. So starting with the uh, the two reports to Council in June, uh, there was a report that went up which um, identified five schools projects um, that were to be prioritised ahead of the, the wider review of the, the capital programme, which is still ongoing. And uh, St Clement's obviously was one of those. And um, it was a commitment that uh, these would be uh, prioritised for capital investment with a further report to come to Council in September, uh, which would give more details on the, the scope, the cost and the uh, programme for uh, all of the projects. Um, so therefore, in September, Julie came forward and it identified that uh, the total budget that was to be approved for St Clements was £13 million. Um, in terms of time scale, um, it was a minimum of three years once the site's been identified, and obviously there's a statutory consultation process to go through as well to relocate the school. Uh, so an indicative date of August uh, 2025 was included in the report. So that was approved and um, obviously a, a positive uh, move in getting the new school. Um, although uh, a new school has been a, a clear priority for the council uh, for a number of years now, this is the first time that we've actually had a, an approved budget in the capital programme. So I think uh, that's a, a definite step forward. Um, in the meantime, we had uh, had discussions with planning about um, the proposed site at Dilkaraki Bray. Um, as suspected, the, uh, the site at Ferry Road that we were looking at was uh, found to be not feasible to develop, um, mainly due to the, uh, the constraints and the requirements to meet SEPA uh, flood guidance uh, and linked to the road issues. So unfortunately, Ferry Bray was uh, ruled out. However, we've taken forward Duffarty Bray. Um, we touched on it in the previous item that um, the Inner Murray Firth Local Development Plan will uh, reallocate, hopefully, um, that area of land to be suitable for a school. Um, so we've been working on that. Uh, we got pre-application advice from planning uh, back in August. We attended their monthly meeting uh, where they look at major projects that are coming forward. Um, they indicated at that point, as has been uh, verified, that they would generally support uh, a school development on that site. Obviously, the usual constraints of traffic, flood risk uh, to work around. Uh, flood risk, um, we've been careful to, um, as we saw in that red, area that was allocated on the in the previous reports uh, where the school campus will be completely out with the flood risk area although obviously we need to make sure that uh, whatever drainage and sustainable urban drainage solutions we put in place uh, don't um, exacerbate any uh, pre-existing flood uh, concerns for the site. Uh, we're working on that at the moment and also uh, our consultants are working closely with um, colleagues in roads to look at the um, wider roads issues so um, although uh, we're not increasing the volume of traffic in Dingle, we're obviously relocating it to our town, but we feel that um, uh, we've certainly managed to come up with uh, a good solution in terms of locating um, the impact of that. And obviously, we have to have good visibility displays. Uh, we need to look at the, the, uh, the um, speed limit around the, the site as well, the site entrance, but uh, that's moving forward positively, and we are keen to try and mop up all of this really before the end of December. Uh, I think the key uh, factor in the timeline going ahead will be uh, the time scale for the statutory consultation, um, which can take up to a year uh, to take forward and complete. So I think the plan mm. would be that if we can um, get to a state before Christmas where we're happy with what uh, we're proposing, uh, that would allow a report to be drafted and potentially taken forward to the February Education Committee. Uh, obviously, uh, with the election coming up after that, we were, we're keen to hit the February dates. Uh, if we have to um, wait till after the, the election period, then that would hopefully extend the timeline quite significantly. So, um, I think all positive at the moment. Uh, we're just working through the final um, issues with planning and roads. And we've got a couple of meetings next week and another one with the, uh, the agent of the landowner as well uh, to uh, start discussing the terms for the purchase of the land. In terms of next steps, uh, members are probably aware we've been trying to set up a the first uh, meeting of the stakeholder group, so that would be a group comprising members, uh, parents, uh, staff and council officers and any other um, committee reps that we think 
uh, should be part of that group. Um, unfortunately, the meeting last week was postponed due to non-availability appearance. Uh, I've been trying to set one up for this week, but again, I think we're probably going to have to go for next week for the, the first meeting. But I think it's important that we have a good representation there for parents and members, certainly for the first meeting. So uh, I'll be in touch in due course to hopefully come up with a date that we can all attend next week. Um, we're also looking to appoint a contractor. We've, um, we're have we doing this in all our major projects um, for a number of reasons. I think the early involvement of a contractor, a designable contractor, helps us uh, with regard to quite a number of areas. I think uh, we're looking obviously at all our new school builds being much more energy efficient and we've got quite strict targets to meet in terms of energy performance. So we're looking at a, a range of uh, measures to achieve that and having a contractor board early and their design team just to do that uh, and also in the current climate with um, tender prices going through the roof uh, having the contract report allowing them to engage with their supply chain uh, suppliers subcontractors etc that should give us more cost certainty and also uh, program certainty rather than going out to tender and not finding out three or four months before you start and say how much is actually going to cost so uh, as i say that's the approach that we're taking across all our major projects so hopefully uh, we should be able to make an announcement fairly soon about who the, the main contractor will be um, so those are the dates. Um, I think August 25, as I say, that's what we're working to at the moment. If we can improve on that, we will, but um, we tend to target uh, an August date for uh, new schools being operational. But August 24 is uh, clearly not um, going to be achievable. Uh, August 25 we're comfortable with, if all goes well with the statutory consultation. Uh, we will have to carefully consider how uh, the school moves into the new building. It, uh, Unlike other uh, schools, primary schools or secondary schools, um, the pupils can't really just all um, turn up on day one and start using new buildings. There has to be a period of transition. So again, that's something we'll pick up uh, during the stakeholder group discussions. So um, that's the update on where we are, but uh, happy to take any questions now. Um, thank you, Robert. Uh, very pleased to hear that uh, the former planning that's gone into in terms of the contractor, I think that's often been missing with other projects. Uh, members, any questions? No. Well, you know how passionately we all feel about this, Robert. Um, it's it's good to see it moving forward. We would ask that this becomes regular on on our committees, and that um, you know, if if there is to be any slippage in the area up to up to or the period up to Christmas, if you could keep us notified that as soon as possible, um, because we 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 mustn't miss. The February committee, um, as you rightly say, it will go into abeyance if we have to park it during the the election. So thank you for coming along this morning, eh, this afternoon, I should say, and we look forward to having the stakeholders meeting next week. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And then we have the Highland. Oh, sorry, we're invited to note that report. I assume we can do that. Um, and moving on to the Highland Coastal Communities Fund Assessment of Applications. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure who's leading on this. Is it you, Sarah? Uh, yes, Chair. Um, Fiona can't make the meeting today. OK, well, I'll hand over to you then. Good afternoon, members. Um, so the application being put forward today is from the Dingwall and District Men's Shed. Um, it is requesting funding support towards laying foundations that will house a social unit and a workshop to establish their craft village. Um, various aspects of the craft village have already been progressed. However, the need for foundations as described in the application were not understood in the initial planning phase. Um, as you will see from the technical assessment that's been provided to committee, the technical assessment hasn't raised any specific issues with the project, um, but just to update um, on my request for further information from the applicant, um, I can confirm that the project has planning permission in place and a building warrant has been issued. Um, they've confirmed that they do have insurance cover, um, which is due for renewal in November, so they will forward the renewed uh, cover to me. Um, they have stated in the application that the main aim of the craft village will be to include all and be to benefit of all. Um, the group don't currently have an equal opportunities policy in place, um, so this has been added as a condition of grant. Um, I think the name in itself, Men's Shed, can be uh, slightly off-putting uh, 
uh, to all members. It might sound like it's exclusively for male use, but that's not the case. Um, but they have followed up to say that um, their three year business plan expires this year and an updated plan together with an updated constitution are scheduled in the near future. Um, so these will incorporate more detail to the fact that um, this craft village is welcome to all members and that all aspects of the equal op opportunities will be covered. Um, the applicant has also confirmed that access for all abilities has been incorporated in the craft village plans and is in line with legislation. Um, and at the time of application, the applicant was not aware of the exact amount remaining in the Dingwall and Seaforth area budget. Um, they have stated that they're applying for £5,000 uh, within the application. However, following that, they have stated that should they have known um, that the amount available was £6,007.91, um, that this is the amount they would have applied for. Um, so can I ask that should members be minded to approve um, the project, please could you state the amount that you wish uh, to be approved, whether at 5000 or the full remaining budget of £6,007.91? I'm not sure about the seven pounds and ninety-one pence, but <laughs> um, members, comments. No. Okay, can I come in, Chair? Of course. Uh, yeah. I, 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 thanks, uh, Sarah, for the for your presentation. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, the name, as you rightly state, uh, is uh, maybe suggesting it's uh, it's a purely a male. Good, and it would be good just to see the, the, the updated constitution so that it is available and, and everybody in the, in, in the community is available to, 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 to see it. And I think as well, it's it's also as well to ensure that the, it is kept, the premises are kept even during construction as well in a tidy, in a tidy uh, state. Uh, there have been one or two complaints uh, that I've had uh, on where they are, where the, where the men's shed are at the present time. So I think it's important as well that cognizance is taken of that, that uh, they're, 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 they're keeping in touch with that, but uh, fully supportive of it, uh, no issue no issue at all. And look forward to receiving you know, confirmation of their new constitution of that and uh, uh, seeing their, their business plan too. Thank you. Thanks, Alistair. I think you're absolutely right. The condition of the, the premises and the surrounding area is very important. and. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a nice area down there. Of yeah. need to keep it like that. So if something like that could be inserted, Sarah would be would be very happy. And I've I've got no problem with it. I'm quite happy with the full amount going to them on this occasion. Yeah. I'm not sure if Angela's still with us. Yes, uh, I am. She uh, here. I was just listening we, I quietly. <laughs> I do we know that you might have to leave? I uh, did. Uh -huh. It's okay. So are you okay with us? Yes, um, I would have just gone with the 5,000, but the extra money, because I thought after the presentation from Ron and the uh, Hefri Way, they could have applied for that. But I think as we're getting near the end of the, the year, then they can have that 6,000. But I wouldn't expect them to come back next year for funding. I think that's fair comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, yeah. does that give you a steer, Sarah? Yes, thank you, Chair. I can add it as a condition of grant that they have to evidence that this site is maintained in a tidy condition. Yep, Good. That would be you. perfect. Thank you. So the committee recommendation or invitation is there. Are we OK with it? Agreed, yes. Agreed, Agreed. to give the 6,000. Okay. Yep. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thanks for your time. And finally, members, we are asked to Approve the minutes of the Dingwall and Seaforth Area Committee held on the 16th of August 2021. Agreed. Which, Agreed. Yep. Okay, well, thanks guys for your time this afternoon. Um, Thank you, Chair. Well, the, initial, the initial technical difficulties ah. were, were overcome. Overcome, so, uh, yeah. And thanks to all the officers for being here, um, in particular, Di. Thanks very much for setting that up, Di. So. Thank you. Thank you. See you later, members. Yes.